I'm Jody Goodkin, and I will be your presenter for our topic, Movement Disorders, Clinical Presentation, and Rehabilitation Considerations. And I have been a physical therapist for almost 30 years now, and I've also been involved in physical therapy education for over 20 years, and I look forward to discussing our topic with you today, Movement Disorders, Clinical Presentation, and Rehabilitation Considerations. A little overview of what we are going to cover today. We are going to examine the contemporary literature related to different movement disorders, specifically conditions that are associated with the extrapyramidal system. So we'll look at different ataxias and dyskinesias, including Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, and a couple of other conditions to look at the pathogenesis, what they currently recognize as the um, cause of these conditions or physiologically what's happening that leads to the clinical presentations that we see. And then for each, we will look at rehabilitation considerations to enhance your interactions with these patients. The rationale is to take a look at the research and see uh, what new information is out there, what additional strategies you might want to incorporate into your rehabilitation programs, and to get that head nod for that uh, what you're already doing, uh, that it, the research still currently supports that. As we're working our way through this course, I want you to consider several different populations of your patients, those obviously that come in with these different diagnoses of movement disorders, and then also also consider if maybe you're in a more orthopedic setting, um, that if you see a patient for a total hip replacement who also presents with Parkinson's disease, though you may not be directly treating that Parkinson's disease, their movement patterns are going to have an impact on how you're able to develop and implement your exercise programs in order to rehab them from that total hip. It may also change your communication strategies. So we're going to be looking at opportunities for early diagnosis and then patients that may have these movement disorders as either their primary or secondary diagnosis. To accomplish this, our goals and objectives are aligned. For every uh, research study that I mentioned, as well as all of the resources that I utilize in developing the course, those are listed at the end of your course notes packet so that you can go on and have additional access to those. We're talking about movement disorders, so it makes sense uh, to be able to see the movements. Because everyone's technology is a little different and I didn't want to risk anyone having challenges, what I did instead of showing videos during the course, at the end of the course notes packet are links to several different videos that will demonstrate the different movement patterns that we discussed today. I felt that that was a better way to avoid technology challenges and so that you continue to have those resources because maybe you're not walking back into the clinic tomorrow and seeing this patient. You might wanna have it available for the future. So those links to uh, different examples of these movement patterns that we'll look at today are included at the end of the course notes packet, as well as links to any tools, assessments, or resources that I thought would be helpful in your clinical practice. As with any course you attend, when you return to the clinic to apply this information, you're going to do so in accordance with the federal, state, and professional regulations where you're practicing, and no conflict of interest exists for the presenter or the provider of this course. As we work through our presentation and you look at your printed version, you will notice that several of the slides have this gold icon on the bottom right that says consider this. That's to let you know that those particular slides are going to be helpful when you go to complete the course post-test later on today. And here we go with our content. Before we can talk about um, atypical movement patterns, it's always good to refresh on what our normal movement patterns are. And uh, I'm briefly going to take you back in time to your neurology courses and AMP courses. I promise to keep it minimal for just what we need to discuss today.
We know that when we initiate movement, we have different uh, systems and neural networks that are firing in order to allow that movement to occur. We have our pyramidal system, which is our voluntary system that is going to transmit those impulses through the cortex down through our corticospinal tract, our corticobulbar tract, in order to initiate that voluntary movement. Where we're focusing today is on that extrapyramidal system. That extrapyramidal system is focusing on controlling more of our automatic movement patterns. Those things that kind of sit in the background that create the baseline for movement to occur. They're going to be responsible for maintaining tone and postural control. Once we learn how to do a task, this is where, um, you know, it's like riding a bike comes from. That our extrapyramidal system is going to have that recall of learning of those automatic processes to execute them. It's also responsible for dampening any unnecessary movement. So if I'm just sitting here still, it's going to stop any extraneous or extra movements from occurring. What we're going to look at today is how the extrapyramidal system influences typical movement for individuals, because if we have disruptions in those different aspects that I just mentioned, it's going to make it challenging for that individual to use their pyramidal system in order to execute their activities of daily living, their work tasks, and other types of activities. When we're considering this extrapyramidal system, it is a regulatory system. It has many different mechanisms involved with centers throughout different aspects and areas of the brain in order to control all of the different um, aspects of movement. We're looking at components in the brainstem, the cerebellum, and then it's also going to have connections out to different regions of our neocortex and cortex. As I mentioned, this system is regulating those uh, automatic type of movements, those involuntary movements. And if we really focus on remembering that, if you wanted a, a shortcut for when you do get these patients, if you're not uh, treating them frequently and you want a way to recognize or remember the movement patterns that might um, turn you to looking at an extrapyramidal system diagnosis are going to be when they have extraneous extra movements or when, and or when the individual has automatic movements that they're unable to initiate. They have challenges with postural um, control. So th those are the patients that we are looking at today. If we think about how movement typically occurs, we don't often pause and, and look at all the different components that come into it. And there are many different ways that this is presented in academia as well as in the research to look at, well, what are the different components that go into movement? We often think of them physiologically that we need to, you know, conduct the impulses down that corticospinal tract. We need that loop coming back from our somatosensory system, our vestibular systems kicking in. And those are all important components. That's looking more at the um, physical execution of the movements, those activation of the um, neurons, that feedback, that muscle firing. And as clinicians, that's often where we are focusing to help our patients improve in those areas. What we want to focus on today is, well, everything else that happens in addition to that or really before that to allow execution of that task. If I want to go pick up this bottle of water, it's not just initiating the contractions. There's other things that happen automatically for that to happen. So one way to look at this is that first we have to have a strategy, that there is that instantaneous and these things happen so quickly that goal of the movement and a movement plan coming into place. You know, that sensing the thirst and saying, okay, I'm gonna grab that bottle of water. This is going to involve execution or should, should say planning within the neocortex and particularly the basal ganglia in order to initiate those movement patterns, that there needs to be enough tone for postural control, that I am still talking as I'm reaching for this water. So that automatic movement and that automatic 
component of my speech and being able to multitask so that everything fits together, that's the basal ganglia that is functioning as that kind of master controller in those aspects. Then we actually need to have our tactics. We actually need to plan the timing of it because as I take a sip of this water each time and that bottle is getting lighter, well, I'm still talking, I'm still controlling my posture, I'm changing my muscle contractions and, and the force that I'm utilizing and I'm coordinating it, right? Because if the weight's different, the force of gravity will be different and the levers, so that changes the muscle contraction. All of those pieces to coordinate the movement have to come into play and that error correction, right? If I'm if I'm not moving well, I'm gonna, you know, spin it, spill it on myself. I wanna keep it steady. So that kind of sensing the rate that adjusting the coordination of it, correcting for the error, oop, too close, don't do that again next time. Those are coming more from our cerebellum and our uh, motor cortex areas. And then, as I said, we have the actual muscle contractions that come into play to execute the movements. And that's kind of the big picture. And where we're looking again is that initial kind of coordination, that automatic component, that background setting up the tone, a uh, focus area of the strategy part today. They're also finding in the research that um, it's not just motor considerations that we have when we look at the extrapyramidal system. They're recognizing more so that the cerebellum and the basal ganglia in particular, because they have so many vast connections out, that they do have a role in cognition and management of emotions, that there are many different aspects that come into play. So while we may be treating that patient for a movement disorder, Looking at it solely that way as um, more of a physical challenge, it's not comprehensive and it could be a lost opportunity to really comprehensively and effectively manage our patients with these different conditions. Because one component that comes into play and something for us to be aware of is that these individuals present also with challenges in decision-making, working memory, and spatial attention. All of that we rely on when we are teaching a new movement or reteaching a movement that someone can no longer perform for a variety of reasons. That they're finding that individuals with basal ganglia dysfunction, they also have difficulty in that planning process and in you know retaining something to then execute it relatively quickly. And then their orientation, their spatial judgments also tend to be off more. And we need to keep that in mind and know we need to retrain those systems also. Additionally, if we consider that movement is off, it's not well executed, it's not smoothly coordinated, right? If you picture that patient who has Parkinson's disease that is fascinating and when they go to turn around, they're starting to sit before they actually turn around. We'll talk about everything that goes into that. In addition to kind of that not appropriate planning or start and stop of movements, they're finding individuals also present with dysmetria of thought, that this overflows into um, their thinking processes. It's a theory that came about in uh, the early 1990s, and there's more research that is coming um, as they look at physiologic studies and the influence of the um, basal ganglia. So just as rate, rhythm, accuracy uh, of voluntary movement and involuntary movement is influenced in these conditions. The same thing happens with the thinking, that the person may not emotionally react okay, that they uh, may not be consistent, they may not be appropriate in their interactions, as well as recognizing emotions of others. They, particularly with negative emotions, that individuals don't necessarily recognize those. So if they're performing, you know, their sit to stand transfer, maybe we make a little gesture with our face to show them they're off or in another patient, they would auto-correct that posture. The patient with the extrapyramidal system dysfunction, they may not read that cue, and that carries over into social situations. 
And then also a reminder that reward and error-based learning is limited. So we need to be more specific in our motivation for patients because they often don't generate that their own internal motivation. Maybe they're refusing to participate or they don't see why they need therapy. That may not be um, just their personality. They may not be um, malicious, if you want to say, in that intent. It might be part of their disease process. Um, So just some, some other things to consider. As we look at the different characteristics of the various movement disorders, so now we're getting back more into the physical presentation that we um, instinctively look at as clinicians, movement disorders present in several different ways. And we look at this in neurodegenerative conditions as well as neurodevelopmental conditions in pediatric and adult populations. Because the conditions that we're talking about today, particularly in our last hour, when we look at hunting disease, Frederick's ataxia, those can occur in uh, younger patients. And then there's that early onset form of Parkinson's disease, where we're seeing more um, early middle-aged individuals. As we look at the different dysfunctions of different systems, when an individual is presenting with dysfunction of their pyramidal system, this is going to be an individual who presents with cerebral palsy, whether they're a child or an adult who continues to present with that condition, Um, stroke, brain injury. When we see dysfunction of the pyramidal system, we're looking more at spasticity, weakness. That's not where we're focusing today. Where we're focusing more is on the cerebellar system, which is that coordination system, and then on our basal ganglia, which is our automatic and our baseline type of system. When we look at these different presentations and we kind of break it up this way, as an individual is presenting to us, and particularly more with direct access, um, we need to really be specific in discerning the clinical presentations that we're seeing in case additional uh, outside referral is necessary. Um, We're going to classify these different physical presentations in order to uh, look at them. So a lot of this we know that we already learned in school, but again, just we'll do a quick little refresh on the different uh, meanings of these clinical presentations. doing your assessment of individuals who present with cerebellar involvement. What we're going to uh, recognize is more of a disorganization of movement. We're going to see that ataxia with inappropriate foot placement, hand placement, um, dysdiocokinesia, the one uh, that we all hoped on our tests back in school was not a fill in the blank, <laughs> so we had to spell it. But those, that's where the individual has difficulty with you know those rapid alternating movements, uh, dysmetria, pass pointing, they can't, you know, kind of stop at the correct point. Those you know. What you may may be new, um, if you don't work a lot with the neurologic population, is titubation. 
Titubation is uh, typical to cerebellar involvement. And this is a slow kind of rhythmic oscillatory movement that you might see of the individual, um, often of the head, of the jaw, might be a little rocking kind of back and forth movement. Um, even though they're at rest, you're going to see that. And it's because of dysfunction of that cerebellar system. We're not getting that dampening of movement. Uh, the type of tremor that an individual with cerebellar damage will, um, or cerebellar involvement uh, will present with is going to be an intention tremor. So intention tremor means when, the in when I go to reach for my water, that's when you're going to see that tremor kick in, typically near the end of that movement for the individual. At rest, there's no tremor. You also might see the individual present with more of a postural tremor if they have cerebellar um, involvement. This is different than the presentation we will recognize in an individual who has involvement of the basal ganglia. When we think basal ganglia, we're thinking that planning, that executing of uh, motor responses, that baseline uh, tone and posture through inhibitory mechanisms and then automatic type functions. That's why an individual with basal ganglia involvement is going to present with bradykinesia, meaning that slowness of movement. It's not necessarily that the individual is weak, it's just that they can't quickly recruit their muscles. And if we remember that, it'll help us when we're retraining that individual with Parkinson's disease, um, that it's not that they necessarily can't do the movement, it's that they can't get it started. It's, it's a slow start. That's why they can also present with hyperkinesia. Brady is slow. Hyper means excess movement. So that means when the individual's at rest, we're going to see um, a lack of that basal ganglia on that extrapyramidal system toning down resting movements. That's why you're going to see different movement patterns when that individual is not attempting voluntary control. That's why it's hyperkinesia, it's excess uh, movement patterns. Um, athetosis is more of worm-like type of movements for the individual. Um, chorea's are more kind of jerky type of movements. Um, dystonia is just a kind of like a contraction of the agonist and the antagonist it can be very painful and uncomfortable for individuals that kind of locks them in when they're attempting to uh, move or even at rest. Rigidity uh, we're familiar with and then the tremor we'll see in individuals with basal ganglia involvement are going to be resting tremors because we don't have that dampening from the higher cortical centers. Um, it is, you know, the pill rolling is a typical example, uh, jaw movement. So those are involuntary. And then when you ask the patient to move, sometimes those resting tremors will dampen a little bit. So based on the actual diagnosis the individual is presenting with, you're going to see different components of those presentations. That just kind of serves as a basic review as you're going through your assessment to see how an individual is presenting. When they look at classification of the different movement disorders, um, it is based on the brain region involved is how the individual is going to present. According to the International uh, Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorders Society, the classification of movement disorders has changed and having been in the field for um, I'll say a minute, <laughs> a little more than a minute. Um, many of you too, you've seen things change over the decades and they're recognizing these conditions are not just classified based on a lobe of the brain involved because they actually have, as we discussed, connections that go out into so many different areas. And what they look at now is more how the individual is presenting. So movement disorders are shifted away from an anatomical classification to more of a symptom classification. And because we're talking about the movement component, an individual is either going to present with hyperkinetic movement disorder or hypokinetic movement disorder. Hyperkinetic means that they're having an increase of involuntary movement. So at rest, there's extra movement, hyperkinesis. Hypokinetic movement disorders are going to mean that the individual has a decrease 
of voluntary movement. They have um, little automatic movements, little um, initiation of active voluntary movements. So the classifications that we're going to look at based on that, the conditions that we will examine that are hypokinetic, where it at its root is related to a challenge with initiating or getting movement going will be our Parkinson's disease and our Parkinsonism conditions. And then hyperkinetic, where the individual has too much excess unchecked movement that then makes it difficult for them to execute their active movement patterns will be tardive dyskinesia, levodopa-induced indi dyskinesia, and Huntington's disease. And then finally, we will look at our ataxia disorders, more of a coordination challenge for individuals that present with Frederick's ataxia. And what I'd like to highlight at this point is a reminder for everyone that my um, attempts at movement patterns is just to, to give you a little bit of a visual and a little bit um, of a trigger. And as I talk about these conditions, um, please know that I recognize deeply that we're talking about human beings and individuals with thoughts and feelings. But to get through the information, I have to take a little more of an anatomic uh, and uh, clinical um, informative perspective. But please know that that my heart is with uh, all the patients with these different conditions. First one we are going to examine is tardive dyskinesia. You're probably hearing more about this. There is a larger um, public awareness campaign. This is um, a condition that arises in individuals with long-term use of medications, specifically targeting um, different neuropsychiatric conditions, uh, individuals who are taking antipsychotic medications to manage um, schizophrenia. They may be on Haldol or Thorazine. Um, also individuals who are taking certain um, antidepressants. Um, maybe some of the research has found that it's individuals who are on trazodone or amitriptylines for long periods of time, as well as individuals who are taking antiemetics. So to control that nausea and vomiting from gastroparesis or a slowness of digestion, even individuals taking a regolin for GERD, this has been recognized in, and then a couple of other medications for Parkinson's disease and epilepsy. So what happens is individuals who are taking these long-term medications for their mental health conditions or gastrointestinal um, disorders, that they start over time to present with a hyperkinetic movement disorder. Their other conditions may be managed by the medication, and then they're starting to show these excess movement patterns that are limiting their ability to um, function and execute their daily activities and are significantly impairing that individual quality of life and, and interaction with um, their world. There was a study in 2020 um, that looked at, it was called the ReConnect study. Um, it was in the United States. It looked at over 700 individuals at 37 different centers throughout the world to get an estimation of how many patients um, on these different medications are presenting with um, the tardive dyskinesia, and they're finding that individuals who are taking one or more um, neuroleptic, which are the medications that we uh, just discussed for different psychiatric conditions, that about 27% of the individuals present with um, tardive dyskinesia. That's significantly decreasing their quality of life. The estimates from the National Alliance on uh, Mental Illness say it's even a little bit higher, almost 30%. And a lot of times this is not reported by the individual. They may not realize that it's a side effect or they, for whatever reason. Um, it's an opportunity for us that when you're looking at your patient's medications, if you see that they're on any of these categories of medications as we're doing our different assessments for whatever condition we're treating them for, if we start to notice the hyperkinetic movement patterns that we're going to discuss, that should be a red flag to us that they need a referral back to the physician in order to uh, more thoroughly diagnose that condition.
what they find is individuals are more susceptible to developing this negative side effect um, or adverse um, consequence from the, the medications if they are particularly on medications to manage uh, schizophrenia because it is directly related to that medication exposure. Usually it's individuals who are on the medications for over three months. However, they are finding that in our elderly patients and combine that with being postmenopausal female that sometimes individuals um, over 60 years old, it could just be, you know, after one month of exposure, they're they're developing these symptoms. Why? What's happening? There's still a lack of a universally accepted uh, theory and on the mechanism um, of tardive dyskinesia. What they seem to recognize now is that it's related to the dopamine receptor blocking agents, um, that as the individual is taking this medication, that decreases the dopamine binding to manage their other condition, whether it's in the brain or the gastrointestinal tract or wherever it may be, to manage those conditions. It's doing a good job at that. However, in the extrapyramidal system of the brain, that dopamine blockage causes on the other end of that synapse a supersensitivity. So now you have where the individual becomes super sensitive to dopamine because the extrapyramidal system that still needs it to function doesn't have enough. It's trying to grab as much of it as it can, but you know, becomes reactive to a lower level. Then when the medication fluctuates that's blocking it and there is more of a flow, now we see these abnormal movement uh, responses that are occurring. Another theory is that it's more related to oxidative stress, that um, that lack of dopamine in the brain where it's needed for our movement patterns, the brain is going to synthesize extra. Well, when it synthesizes extra and it's not all utilized, the different free radicals are going to be released. Um, there's an alteration in the cell membrane of the neural um, neurons, and they seeing that it actually leads to cell apoptosis or cell death of those neurons, particularly the basal ganglia seems to be very sensitive to that neurodegeneration. And then the last theory is that the medications are just direct, directly toxic in that extrapyramidal system. So you might wonder, well, well, why are they still taking it? It might be because it still is managing their primary condition, but there needs to be recognition that the individual is developing this tardive dyskinesia because it is such a negatively impactful condition on their life. It needs to be recognized early and modifications made because unfortunately, for most individuals, the um, abnormal movement patterns do become permanent. What you're going to look for, um, often it starts with more orofacial involvement that the individual, you know, they're protruding their lip, smacking, chewing on their gums more, a lot of perioreal movements, or even they're doing a lot of blinking. Maybe they puff their cheeks a little more or pucker. Mm for that, what seems like a, an unknown reason. And this is just us being observational, um, things that you might just be like, oh, that's just that person. Um, if you're putting the pieces together with their medical history and the other movement patterns um, and medications, you might say, mm, I need to refer this patient to have this assessed more. Um, it can actually spread to twisting and writhing movements in the extremity and the neck and the trunk. And this be can become very severe for the individual, inhibiting their ability to perform work tasks, to perform their ADLs, to perform their safe, uh, their uh, self-care. And it can increase in uh, frequency for them. Typically, it starts with that face, then spreads to the upper extremity, lower extremity, and then trunk seems to be uh, the last region of the body um, impacted. The reason it's called tardive dyskinesia is tardive means that there's that delay in the presentation of the symptoms from when the individual starts the medications for their neuropsychiatric 
um, condition. And uh, at during that time, those neurons are deteriorating, leading to the symptoms. So really early detection is key that this is the big push for early detection to recognize this condition because it's not talked about as much. The U.S. Department of Education, uh, the Department of Health and Human Services in uh, 2009, since 2019 has done a large public awareness campaign encouraging people to, you know, recognize recognize this, talk to their doctors to um, see maybe medication adjustment early can help limit the progression of it um, and what symptoms they have may persist, but maybe it's caught at such a low level um, that it's not significantly impactful on their lives. Um, many states have actually implemented legislation to make the first week in May, Tardive Dyskinesia Awareness Month might be an opportunity if your clinic is doing a public education and outreach to make awareness of this condition. There are a couple new medications that are out to try and manage the different uh, symptoms. Um, Impresia, a studio, you may have heard the, the commercials for them, um, trying to look at managing the symptoms. It's still a relatively newly recognized condition. Um, so the, the treatment isn't there. In terms of us managing these patients, if we are, again, seeing them for another diagnosis, Maybe they had a fall because of their, their hyperkinetic movement pattern. Well, we want to be aware of this and incorporate some strategies in our rehab uh, to assist them to help avoid that fall. Having an understanding of the condition will help with that. Um, they're often going to prevent because of the oral facial involvement with dysarthria, difficulty with that speech forming, difficulty with swallowing, and TMJ um, pathology to watch for the individual. And and then for many individuals, when it progresses to the trunk, it can involve their respiratory uh, capacity. So they might present with respiratory distress. So we might be doing some different uh, breathing exercises, postural awareness um, for that patient to help with their swallowing, keeping that chin, you know, parallel as they're attempting to swallow. So posture uh, education and training might be beneficial. Um, because they have these Korea dance-like type of movements, activities of daily living might be inhibited. Um, you might want to consider doing an IADL assessment, instrumental activities of daily living, so that you can look comprehensively at the tasks the individual is having difficulty with that are beyond gait and bathing. Look at their organizational skills, you know, shopping, meal prep, um, interacting with technology, because these are individuals who are of a range of ages that are still out there functioning and we want to be comprehensive in helping them interact um, with their worlds because in addition to the movement disorder, they have their baseline mental health challenges. So you can imagine how it, it kind of builds. They took this medication to try and help them and now they have this other challenge, um, can be very socially isolating. Some of the research is finding that to increase physical capacity does seem to be helpful to try and maintain uh, cardiovascular fitness for individuals, has some benefits in addition to, um, you know, health and wellness benefits for them. That is our first condition of tardive dyskinesia. Our next condition that we're going to discuss is Parkinson's disease, which is probably where you thought I was going to start. Um, we know a lot already about Parkinson's disease. Uh, so some of what I discussed may be, may be a review or reinforcement of what you're already um, aware of. We know that this condition is relating to uh, the dopaminergic pathway in the brain, uh, specifically the basal ganglia, impairment of those neuronal circuits, not allowing for appropriate functioning, and individuals present with those different uh, or specific classic motor symptoms. What we need to recognize is those motor symptoms are not really evident until about a 60 to 80% decrease in the dopamine production. So until there's a significant amount of neurodegeneration, we're not even seeing the motor symptoms. So again, the big push is on earlier diagnosis, earlier awareness, preservation of as much as possible for that individual. So looking more at biomarkers to catch it early. And not to forget, we're calling this these movement disorders they all present with significant um, symptoms that are impactful for the individual's 
life that are non-motor in nature and tend to evidence themselves even earlier on, extending out particularly into the limbic system, the cognitive uh, systems in later phases too. The pathogenesis of Parkinson's disease, where we're at today in considering this, um, we know that dopamine is that neurotransmitter in the brain that is important to allow movement to be smooth and controlled. They don't know exactly the trigger. They're looking at different genetic triggers, environmental components. Regardless of what is triggering this cascade of events, what they're finding the culprit is, is alpha synuclein. This is located in the neurons of the brain, and cumulative evidence is suggesting that this in particular um, becomes a neurotoxic culprit for the degeneration that is occurring. Typically, that alpha synuclein should allow um, normal conduction of impulses, normal functioning of the um, neurons in the brain. Unfortunately, what's happening is it is kind of clumping and building up in areas. And as that clumping is starting, the individual forms Lewy bodies. And that is where you're going to see the different neurons then because we have clumping at those synapses in inability for them to conduct their impulses appropriately. So now the synapses are not firing, particularly in that basal ganglia area for the brain. Synapses are not firing appropriately. The body is going to try and adapt to that. What they recognize now is that as there is inappropriate firing of the neurons, when they actually look at those neurons, the mitochondria, that powerhouse, the lysosomes that break down and play a role in repair, they're not functioning appropriately either. And now we have apoptosis of those neurons or death of those neurons that is occurring. Without that dopamine, in order to have them fire, that's why we're seeing the cascade of um, events that leads to the clinical pre presentation for the individual because the cells have actually died and those neurons are no longer there and functioning it th that's why we see a progression and then there isn't a way to really repair that damage so that's why the focus is really on preservation kind of preserve the integrity as long as possible uh, to maintain a highest level of function and quality of life for individuals what they're recognizing um, as they kind of say, well, how can we speed up this process to see what happens, you know, in cells to do our testing, to find medications, to find biomarkers? They're recognizing up on the International Space Station uh, that in the microgravity environment, the um, alpha synuclein and the abnormal neuronal cells, they tend to replicate a lot faster. So they're actually working with scientists on the ground and up at the space station to create the cell samples more quickly so they can test different treatments and analyze them more closely uh, to hopefully get answers sooner to help manage this condition. I thought that was really interesting uh, how they're able to, to pull that in. As we look at Okay, they want to diagnose this earlier. Well, what do we know? We tend to see patients once the condition has already progressed. And we do have an opportunity to start maybe seeing pieces of the puzzle sooner. And we might actually, or I should say, hopefully we'll be seeing patients earlier on in the disease process to teach them strategies so that there's preservation for as long as possible. A lot of this relates to uh, Breck's hypothesis. And this is uh, looking at the idea that there is not a random development of Parkinson's disease. The hypothesis says that, yes, there is some kind of pathogen. There's some kind of trigger. Something starts this because some individuals present with Parkinson's disease, others do not. That piece they haven't quite figured out yet. But what they're recognizing is that some type of pathogen is either entering between 
the olfactory system or the enteric system, the GI system. And they're seeing these early signs even decades before when they go back and look at individuals who have Parkinson's disease, that they have impairment of their sense of smell. They present with constipation that's not really associated with any other gastrointestinal or other diagnosis. That pathogen then seems to be taking the path of the vagus nerve in order to enter that central uh, nervous system. And it's working its way up towards that basal ganglia, where then it caused that significant damage that we just discussed. And then as it continues to spread, those thin, poorly myelinated axons in the brain it are then going to be impacted. And that's why we start to see more neocortex, late cognitive involvement and dementia for individuals along that disease uh, progression of Parkinson's disease. So at different stages of the disease, they're able to kind of go back and see that those alpha synuclein um, and Lewy body formations are in different areas of the brain and even starting to see in uh, different areas of the body. Um, so they're looking at recognizing earlier this progression so that there can be sooner treatment for individuals. As we look at the clinical presentation for Parkinson's disease, we all have a a clear picture of the uh, typical presentation. So I'm not going to um, go over the components that you're already aware of. I'm going to highlight um, some other aspects that might not be the first pieces that come to mind that we do need to recognize and address for our patients. The bradykinesia, that uh, slowness of movement for individuals with Parkinson's disease, when we're working with them, I always find it helpful to remember that it's it's not that they're just moving slow. They're not just choosing to, okay, let's stand up to not go. And it's important to, I think, educate the families on that too. What's occurring because of the regions of the brain involved is that it's an inability to regulate that activation system of movement. Doing sit to stand is automatic. Well, that's the center that is compromised for that patient. They can't generate enough force fast enough to actually make it happen. And if we think about that, then it might help us when we're doing that sit to stand training with the patient in terms of the strategies we want to use, that it's a problem to, to get it going. Just continually tell them, okay, let's move faster. It, that's not the challenge for them. It's that they literally can't activate quick enough or fast enough. That's why we see the individual um, on the other side of things also, they can't slow down or stop the movements fast enough because they, they can't um, kind of sequence stopping one movement and starting the other. The best example of that is the individual is approaching the chair and before they turn around to sit, they're, before they um, sit, they haven't turned yet. So they're right approaching that chair. They're starting to sit, but they haven't turned around to get back to the chair yet. It's because they can't coordinate the um, starting the turn and starting the sit with stopping the turn. They just can't sequence all that. That's the challenge. So when we look at our different cues and strategies, we're going to incorporate things that help reteach from that or help compensate for that difficulty that they're having. They can't stop one thing and then start the next um, easily. That That's the problem. Also look at um, the excess salivation that individuals present with. That bradykinesia extends to the swallowing. They're just not swallowing as often. They might need reminders to to do that. Um, they're not blinking as often, so their eyes may get more dry. We might see some um, visual challenges with that. The hypokinesia we know presents as micrographia, like everything gets smaller for the individual. All their movements get, get smaller. They may, you know, you may tell them to reach out in front and they're reaching and they think they're going to hit you, but they're not even close because they can't um, recognize that, that they can't judge the, the excursion that's really happening there. Uh, this is an example from 1869, an individual with micrographia, where we kind of see it trailing off, getting smaller there, um, which is classic for individuals with Parkinson's disease. Um, the same thing happens with their voice. The voice tends to get very small and quiet. 
um, they get more monotone. There's many different reasons for that, um, that kind of, that come into play. Part of it is, again, the um, amplitude of things, the regulation and recognition of that is off. So they may think they're screaming, but they're not. We have to teach them to over-exaggerate everything um, to get it into the right, right zone. Um, there also tends to be more respiratory compromise that's occurring. There's slower, um, less excursion of respiratory movement, which is something to also work on. So the breath support for speech is not there. So that's why the, the speech gets a little quieter. Um, also work with them in a quiet room. If you're in home care, have the TV off, let the family members know of this. So they kind of limit distractions to make it um, easier to hear the individual. Um, also consider uh, that there could be fatigue of the respiratory muscles. Maybe they, you know, take a rest, talk in phrases, and then wait. Let's make sure we give them time to pause in between. Uh, maybe don't have them trying to talk as we're doing different activities, not only because that's multitasking um, and it's dual tasking, I should say, um, that they may or may not be ready for, but look at just the respiratory support of uh, speech that becomes impaired. There's not a air going through those vocal cords. So one strategy, again, is to teach that patient because swallowing can be impaired too if you're working with speech therapy and OT, uh, all of us together. We need to keep that chin parallel when they're trying to swallow and when they're trying to speak. So work on posture with that uh, might be helpful for them. Uh, facial masking, festinating, freezing, um, all of these components we are recognizing. Um, and then we have those non-motor features that we'll look at also. There was a newer test out there called the DAT scan. It is an attempt to actually show on imaging Parkinson's disease. There's a little bit of debate as to why, why do it. Um, one of the reasons is it's not any better than the clinical assessments that already exist. They're finding in the research this particular test that I'll explain, it has um, equivalent diagnostic capabilities to traditional clinical symptom assessment. So the question is, well, it's expensive, it's exposure, why do it? Uh, the hope is, you know, the research will get there so that there's earlier diagnosis and it can be utilized more. What it does is there is a, um, a introduction of a uh, tra transducer or a tracer, I should say, uh, that's injected into the individual. It is dopamine sensitive, so it is going to travel to the brain, to those dopamine receptors in the brain. And if you look at the left image here, on the right hand side, see what kind of looks like a yellow, almost like comma there? That's an individual um, with an intact system, that, that region of the brain. On the left hand side here, see how it looks more like a period? That is an individual um, that is demonstrating Parkinson's disease because there's not as much dopamine um, tracer uptake in that area to recognize it. So then we know there's less signaling from the dopamine receptors in that area. I just wanted to put that in there in case you do see more uh, of those scans coming or you have the opportunity to see one yourself. What's used more commonly is a traditional uh, diagnostic scale based on clinical uh, assessment measures. The honin yar scale uh, is very simple. It was originally reduced, introduced back in the uh, late 1960s. It's since been um, you know, updated as uh, needed. What we're looking at is the current modified version. And what it does is look at the movement um, disorder component for the patient to classify them in a stage of Parkinson's disease. An individual between one and two is going to be an early stage of Parkinson's disease. That may be the individual who at a level uh, one and a half, maybe they're starting to show some trunk rigidity. At a level two, they have a little bit of gait impairment that's obvious. Um, activity may be a little more difficult and time consuming, but they're still functioning fine. Once we get to individuals between a two and a three, this is more of the mid-stage 
of the disease, an individual who is at a three, that's more likely to be your patient who has um, mild to moderate disability. They're having episodes of loss of balance. They might already be falling at this point. Uh, they're having challenges with eating and dressing. We're actually starting to see um, impairments in their ADL activities, but they're still independent. And then when an individual progresses to a four or five, that's when we see they need um, more assistance. And that's considered the later stages of the diseases um, where they can't function alone and then progressing towards a significantly impaired or no function, hallucinations, cognitive decline, uh, to give you an idea of that scale. And it would be helpful to know maybe when you're treating your patients where they are in that scale, uh, just so that you have a sense of the disease progression. Given uh, it's not on a specific time frame for everybody to progress differently, but it just gives a, a little bit more of an idea and it might help in your planning as to what resources they may need. Additionally, what we're monitoring for patients are those non-motor features, which are just as important to be aware of because they impact the motor function we're working on. And if we look at the whole patient to uh, look at our goal setting and enhance their quality of life and their performance, we need to consider these other areas. Gastrointestinal involvement, constipation specifically, it may not be something that is talked about very frequently, but we might want to know if our patient is having issues with constipation. Remember we said a very early sign, uh, and it does continue during the disease process, is that constipation because of those dopamine receptors in the uh, gastrointestinal system. And it's such a significant concern for individuals with Parkinson's disease that the VA has a recipe for prune whip that supposedly is fabulous. I'll be honest, I, I haven't tried it yet. Um, but it might be, you know, something small that is significantly impactful for that individual if we can help them get up and moving more, if we make that dietary referral, their referral back to the physician to see if that constipation needs to be addressed because it can be painful. Maybe they can't communicate that. Um, maybe they're, you know, stressing on the toilet and that's raising their blood pressure. We know that there can be so many impacts of that. Looking at sensory awareness, we already talked about smell. If we notice the individual is having difficulty physically eating, then on top of it, they have a decreased sense of smell. They may not be motivated to eat. Maybe they need more of a diet, dietitian referral um, to make sure that they're eating to sustain their body weight, that olfactory impairment um, is, is important to recognize, as well as pain uh, may be significant for individuals, uh, particularly in the later stages when there is significant cognitive decline, they may not be able to communicate that they have pain. And then when we see more of the facial masking, we can't use that as an indicator. So we would need to use different pain scales in order to assess that and let family members know. 
Cognition, we're going to consider as we are working with our patients, the type of cues we give them, how we interact with them. Uh, individuals are at a risk of dementia in the later stages, as well as depression throughout the disease process. Memory is impaired. We're going to want to use different tools, attentional strategies, cue cards, even around the home to help them with that memory and that decision-making um, process. The individual in later stages of the diseases may also start presenting with hallucinations. So if you're working with someone in more of the advanced stages and they're, you know, reaching for something and you're trying, you know, you're working on balance and you're trying to have them reach over here and they're continually reaching over here, maybe it's a hallucination. Maybe it's that visual spatial awareness that is impaired and they think they're reaching for the object or they see a spot on the floor or something dark as they're ambulating and they're trying to go around it because they think it's a hole, but we're like, no, we're walking this way. They're having an episode of loss of balance, not necessarily. So something for us to be aware of. For all patients, I feel it's helpful to be aware of their sleep patterns. We want to make sure patients are comfortable. If they have other comorbidities, can we adjust their sleeping position because sleep is already compromised? So anything we can do in order to help improve that. The tendency will be towards taking naps during the day, that general daytime fatigue that should be discouraged, you know, maybe only one nap a day, not too close to the end of the day. For that individual, and also know if they're very tired, that may impact their ability to function. In terms of cardiovascular compromise, orthostatic hypotension is a risk for these individuals. Um, and when we combine that with uh, the nocturia, urgency, frequency, um, we have a big concern there with fall risk. There is some recognition that elevating the head of bed when an individual is sleeping at night changes the circulation to the kidneys so it can decrease urine production. Less urine production during the night will help decrease that need to get up during the night, and then it'll help retain a little more of the plasma volume. So when that individual does get up for the first time, there'll be a less likelihood of that development of orthostatic hypotension, but they might need compression garments and you know strategies to take their time getting up to avoid that risk of falling at that uh, point in time. We don't want to forget vision. Uh, any patient with balance or impairment or fall risk, we should be looking at their vision, particularly for these individuals with Parkinson's disease. Um, there are dopamine receptors in the retina that can become um, degenerated during the disease process that can directly impair vision. Um, it seems to impact more contrast and specifically colors Combine that with they're having decreased blinking, so the eyes are going to dry out more, decrease tear production, all of that together causes challenges. In addition to just seeing contrast and seeing colors, what they're noticing in individuals with Parkinson's disease is that all of these um, combinations lead to a decrease in their ability to do scanning. So when we're walking, we're kind of looking at what's ahead of us. We're already starting to plan and think obstacle avoidance and things like that. Unfortunately for individuals with Parkinson's disease, they have a much slower scanning ability combined with these visual impairments. It leads to less anticipatory movement uh, that could potentially increase that risk of fall. So that's something to maybe look out for. Um, and again, see maybe a simple vision test, simple contrast test, and see if a referral is necessary um, to address their vision. So some other things to consider in pieces that we can add into um, how we're treating the patient as well as our assessments to make sure we're addressing all the little pieces that we know come together into the big picture to get them towards that functional goal that we're working on. There are many different assessment tools that are out there. I pulled a couple of specific specific ones, excuse me, uh, related to individuals with Parkinson's disease. This condition spans decades of life, so the individual's needs are going to change over time. We're not forgetting the social impact for the individual as well as their caregiver. At different points in the disease process, the caregiver might be the one providing information for the assessment to paint that picture of what happens outside of the clinic. So we're thinking about quality of life as well as uh, functional 
movement for the individual. The tug test is a standard looking specifically at Parkinson's disease. Uh, there was a 2020 systematic review of individuals with Parkinson's disease to look at some uh, standard outcome assessments related to the tug. It is shown to have good uh, validity, reliability, intertester, intertester especially when you compare it to other um, balance tests for individuals with uh, Parkinson's disease. What they're finding in terms of your typical tug, stand up, walk, turn around, come back, that about 12 seconds is our threshold of concern for individuals with uh, Parkinson's disease. That's about our norm. If we're looking at the cognitive, where you're having the individual either do serial counting by threes or naming animals, something that puts a cognitive demand on it, what they're seeing is about 14.7 seconds as a normative value. Um, and then when we look at a motor, uh, maybe you're having them, you know, switch change between their hands or carry a tray with a ball on it, something to add a motor demanding task to it. Um, they're looking at about a 13, this particular study, 0.2 second uh, normative, normative value there. Um, and then you could actually do both, do a combined uh, dual task assessment for uh, individuals. So... The other assessment tools that you might be utilizing for individuals with uh, Parkinson's disease, the Movement Disorders Society, um, Modified Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale, which is a mouthful, yes, uh, but it is a very comprehensive tool. Um, this tool has um, several different sections to it. It was originally developed in the late 1980s. It was revised, I think it was around 2007, because what they found in the tool was that it didn't clearly separate out the motor and the non-motor components. And both are equally as important and should be addressed. So this new tool is going to have specific aspects of assessment for the um, non-motor components of hallucinations, apathy, mood, sleep problems, urinary challenges. So all those things that we already discussed to gather information on that. And then also look at motor components, um, typical that we would look at in terms of tone, freezing of gait, et cetera. Um, the component of motor examination is in there as well as complications for patients. When they did the revision of this tool, something that I think was important to mention is that they scaled it back and reworded it so that the tool can be um, understood by an individual who is reading at a seventh grade level. That should be about the standard when we're developing any tools that are utilized uh, by patients uh, for it to be more broadly applicable, to not have that as a, as a variable. Um, and it can be utilized by either the caregiver or the patient. The idea is that it's going to come up with a scale to give you a level of impairment for the individual. Uh, lower values indicate better functioning for the individual. When we look at the minimal clinically important difference, meaning there has been hopefully an improvement or if there's a deterioration, that threshold of change is somewhere between 2.5 and uh, three points on this scale is your uh, minimal clinically important difference. If you look at an individual part and then a four to six if you're looking at it uh, overall. Two other components, it does include that hone in your scale that we already looked at. And then the other assessment is the modified Schwab and England activities on daily living scale. That particular uh, tool, it's pretty short. It's looking at on a scale of zero to 100%, how independent is that individual in their functioning? So it just gives short little statements to gauge how independent someone is. Um, for example, someone who's at a 50% scale, they're more dependent, um, they need help with at least half the movement, they're slower, they're having difficulty with everything. Versus an individual who's at 20%, 
can do nothing alone. Um, maybe they can do a little bit of help if they're given some chance to try to do that. They, they will try it sometimes, uh, doing little chores, trying to help out, but they're really severely impaired and they're not able to execute anything at that 20%. So that's just a quick little uh, scale that is part of this overall tool also. So it's pretty comprehensive and will give you a lot of different um, aspects to consider in order to develop your programs and additional referrals that might be necessary. More of a checklist tool is the Parkinson's disease questionnaire, the PDQ-39. This particular tool is having the individual consider over the last month how often they have been affected in different ways because of their Parkinson's disease. And again, it can be completed by the patient or their caregiver. It will include those typical domains of mobility and ADL that are our go-to. Um, you know, are you able to hold a drink without spilling it? Um, are you able to get around in public? But then it adds those other components, uh, looking at stigma, that emotional component. You know, is the individual embarrassed to be in public? Do they avoid eating when they're in public? Um, communication skills are considered in it, looking at speech components, pain consideration. It also incorporates uh, cognition questions, looking at memory, hallucinations. That might be those patients that let you know they're in a more advanced stage of the disease process. Um, and then emotional well-being that we know is important. So uh, this tool, again, is going to give you a lot of different pieces of information that can help you in ha maybe how to interact and approach the person. If you know that they're already saying they're weepy, they're tired, they just don't care, we may need to be a little more motivational and creative with that particular patient. Um, so they're looking at uh, that in this particular scaled uh, score or the way you score uh, this particular tool. It's a self-report measure. Again, it can be patient or caregiver that is completing it. And a lower score means that they have a better quality of life. Wouldn't it be nice if all of our different tools kind of had the same <laughs> assessment? High is good, low is not as uh, beneficial, but they each have their own way. The Montreal Cognitive Assessment is a tool that you might utilize more for your patient who is um, where you have concerns that they might be progressing towards dementia, where they're, or you just want to know, you're not sure, you want to know how well are they following commands, how well are they interpreting information so that you can decide. Once we talk more about dual tasking, if you're thinking, well, yes, yeah, so I do want to incorporate more uh, dual tasking type of activities for that patient. Well, maybe if you do the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, before you challenge that patient on naming animals or name as many letters as you can with the letter F, as you're doing this challenging balance activity, maybe you want to see if they can do that task on their own first. So the Montreal Cognitive Assessment includes those little um, 
quick assessments on attention, on uh, memory, recall, naming, things like that to give you some information that then you can use to see, well, how do I need to modify my cues? How complex should I make that dual tasking activity that I'm going to do with the patient? Do they need cue cards in order to execute their activities of daily living? And then should I be using that when I'm doing training with that patient? If I'm doing my sitting balance and I want to make sure they can swallow while they're sitting after I did my posture control, do they need that little cue card that says one, two, three, swallow, that then they take with them home and we teach them that mantra? Um, so using a cognitive assessment tool might let give you a little more information that'll help you um, further enhance your functional activity training you're doing with the patient or even your basic exercise training uh, to know how to approach them better and then how to get carryover into their daily lives or compensatory mechanisms you may need to teach them and or their caregiver. Motor assessment technology is emerging for individuals who present with uh, Parkinson's disease. The idea is to consider that. We see them, we know this for such a small window. What happens when they are outside the clinic? Is what we're doing really carrying over? Do they have other challenges that we're not really aware of? So they're coming up with different types of sensors and wearable technology, either wristbands or on shoe straps or across the chest that can give the clinician insight um, as to how the individual reacts to stimuli in their own environment. Look at fatigue. They're looking at it for medication effectiveness and consistency throughout the day relating to uh, performance. There was a 2016 study, so it's slightly dated, um, but it was pretty comprehensive looking at several different uh, devices that were out. It was the Journal of uh, Neuroengineering and Rehab. Uh, this systematic review pulled several different uh, wearable types of technology, and they did find that it, when you look at the assessments we just talked about, the Parkinson's disease rating scale, and just taking that as a survey versus the individual who then went out and wore the technology and they were able to physically read the function, they did find that in terms of gait and posture, there was a strong correlation. There seems to be good accuracy in these tools. So it might be something emerging that you uh, will utilize to get more information. If you're looking at technology in the clinic to utilize, um, I mean, I went to school in the day where computers barely existed, <laughs> um, which is scary to say. So it's, it's wonderful to see all this. Um, so I'll tell you when um, there was a posture system that first came out in the very early 90s, and it was like, oh my gosh, to get one was amazing. Uh, then when the Wii came out, and you could have that right there at your fingertips, right? That was great. And now we're on wearable technology. I pulled some research looking at if you do have in clinic because that motivation and reward system needs to be triggered in our patients with Parkinson's disease. They may not kind of muster up naturally um, that motivation. So sometimes using gaming systems is helpful with that. Um, there were some recommendations in the research that the We Balance Board has a good correlation to being beneficial to assist individuals with Parkinson's for carryover into their function because it's visual, it's auditory, it's proprioceptive in nature. It also helps with their attention to keep them focused. Um, it makes the activities more cognitive, which kind of uh, bypasses that automatic system in the basal ganglia that's not working by making it more cognitive. Um, and then it's motivational also. It's going to help them control like the velocity, the frequency of their movements. Um, they did find good carryover even into gait. The particular games that seem to be uh, helpful because it not only challenged physical function, but also cognitive demand as well as working memory to actually execute the game was the penguin slide, uh, the balance bubble, and the soccer heading. So if you wanted to uh, consider that, research seems to support those as helpful. Overall exercise for our individuals with uh, Parkinson's disease, it does seem to be neuroprotective in nature. So just getting the person up, moving, exercise in general, because we're not always going to be seeing them in therapy. 
the, there seems to be that benefit to as part of our discharge planning to have a general, um, you know, cardiovascular or health and wellness fitness component in addition to our specific exercise and training for that individual. Um, exercise also increases body awareness. It can increase quality of life, emotional health and well-being. So there are a lot of different positive effects. It could be a way for them connecting with their community, with their caregiver in a different way. We know about all the different motor benefits. And then, as I said, they're finding that working memory and mood is also improved for individuals, that mental health component to combat some of the depression that individuals might be more prone to. They also find that there's a little more mental flexibility that comes from individuals with Parkinson's disease who are exercising uh, more frequently. When they look at the dopamine receptors in the brain for individuals who exercise um, with Parkinson's disease, kind of getting to the root physiology of it here. It was a really small cohort study that I found in Canada. Um, they only had, it was a cohort of under 20 between the control and the uh, participation group. And they were individuals who habitually exercised with Parkinson's disease and those with Parkinson's disease who were more uh, sedentary. And when they compare their um, functional MRI scores, they did find that those who participated in exercise had um, increased dopamine synthesis. They had less apathy that was evidenced in their interactions, less bradykinesia. So there seems to be growing support that exercise does change those dopamine uh, receptors slightly in the brain in a positive way for individuals with Parkinson's disease. So then how do we develop these exercise programs? We, we'll talk about how do we train someone for different functional tasks through different attentional strategies and dual tasking. What we're looking at now is just general exercise programs to help give them a musculoskeletal wise, balance wise, what they need to perform their activities and that general cardiovascular um, fitness and health and well-being. The American American Physical Therapy Association Clinical Practice Guideline for Individuals with um, Parkinson's Disease um, analyzed studies for individuals who were in the early to mid stages of Parkinson's disease. And there seems to be high quality evidence that supports these strategies that I'm detailing here. And I do include a link to that because I'm just briefly going to highlight some of them uh, for you to consider. That aerobic conditioning has the uh, benefit of increasing oxygen consumption, functional capacity. It seems to help decrease the disease uh, severity for individuals. The optimal dosing, they say, it's not specifically determined yet, but it seems to be when individuals are exercising for them at a moderate to high intensity cardiovascular uh, fitness level. So we can do, they could do walking, maybe they're on a treadmill. However, that patient who has freezing of gait, you probably don't want to put on a treadmill for safety measures. So that individual might be doing uh, maybe a recumbent bike. So you're going to pick a mode that's appropriate for each patient, considering their safety and their, their cognitive ability to participate, the bradykinesia that they have. Just because someone presents with Parkinson's disease doesn't mean we can't be doing resistance training for those individuals. We're going to use our American College of Sports Medicine basic guidelines for progression for the individual. Um, there was no one particular exercise that was recognized as best. It did seem to be like typical exercise programs, you know, two times a week, up 30 to 60 minutes of exercise seems to be uh, beneficial. And going for those three sets of 15 exercises to reach that goal for um, the patient. One study that I found, because I wanted to, we all know the basic exercises, and I, and I wonder, you know, how can we challenge our patients more with Parkinson's disease? And the fact that just because someone has impaired mobility doesn't mean they can't um, be more challenged with balance while they're doing their resistance exercise. We do have that cognitive demand component. We do have that concern about automatic functions, but there are ways that we can kind of piece all that together. And one particular study looked at individuals um, 
for using resistance training with instability. They had the individuals on a BOSU ball or they had them on a Dyna desk while they're doing their upper extremity exercises or while they're doing their squatting and their lunges. So they added that dynamic surface uh, component or on a physio ball as they're doing their upper extremity work. And these were researchers out of Chicago and Brazil that teamed up and they did find that when they use that dynamic change challenge in there um, that patients not only had increased in strength, they improved their tug by almost two seconds. Um, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment scores improved, the PDQ, the Parkinson's disease rating scale improved, so they became more functional. And it seems that increasing the complexity of the motor tasks seems to increase cortical firing to it helped the patient in multiple different ways that presents with Parkinson's disease. In addition, any activity or training that we're doing with the patient, looking at balance, looking at strengthening, or even functional training, because they have that tendency towards hypo or small movements and slow movements, we're going to have them exaggerate any motions that we're having them doing. So in addition to that strength training, that cardiovascular, that aerobic training, we're going to have any movements they do, they're going to do it larger scale. They're going to exaggerate it because their tendency when they actually move is going to be to make that smaller. We're going to encourage rhythmic movements also because that's where the challenges often are. On-off phenomena is something to consider when you're scheduling your rehab and when you're assessing patients. Maybe you see them in the clinic and they're doing well with their functional activities, but when you use that a different assessment tool that we looked at, they're scoring lower on their function. The on-off phenomena may be accounting for this. What it means is when uh, the individual is taking that levodopa, it's going to cross the blood-brain uh, barrier to be converted, converted to dopamine in order for functioning. It's usually combined with carbidopa when the individual uh, takes the medication um, because it's going to prevent that breakdown before it actually gets to the brain. And when the medication is working well, the symptoms are managed, that's the on time. So everything's working good, the individual symptoms are managed, the medication's at a good level. Unfortunately, because the disease process is still continuing, there is decreased um, functioning of the nerves because there are less present because of the cell depth. Uh, death, that the dopamine itself is just not stored as well by the deteriorating neurons. So over time, it can't pull from those stores as well. The individual, as they're aging, the gastrointestinal system just may not absorb the medication as well. So there are all these different reasons why over time, the medication is not working. So we're going to have fluctuating levels of performance for the individual. They're going to need more of the medication to keep it at the same level in the brain, to keep them physically functioning at the same level. Well, at different times of the day, there'll be a natural fluctuation. First thing in the morning before they get up, the level may be low. Before that next dose, before that next dose kicks in. So there'll be these different times throughout the day where the individual's symptoms are going to return and those are our off times where they're having decreased functioning. I would say consider if you always see your patient in that on time, are we using all of our resources and capturing them at the best time to really be most impactful on their daily life. That maybe they have trouble with their function at different times during the day and we need to see them when that's happening so we can teach them and their caregiver appropriate strategies. So you might wanna consider having journaling done to see when their on and off times are and maybe see them at a mix of on and off times if you're coming up with your goals I would consider this particularly, and this is just me talking, when you're looking at discharging a patient, if you think, you know, they've plateaued, or if you've worked on everything, have you seen them during an off time to know if maybe there's something more we can do? And use a scale that's going to assess that also, and some of the ones we discussed do. As we look at overall rehab considerations for our patients with uh, Parkinson's disease, at different phases, or I should say stages of the disease process, our focus may shift a little bit.
I mentioned we're going with large amplitude and speed of movements all the time because their tendency is to go slow and small. So we want to encourage more of uh, the opposite. Um, looking at rewarding tasks, having them be positive experiences. In the early stages, this is where we're focusing along with dual tasking. As the individual is progressing more into the later stages of the disease process, this might be where they need more external supports in order to be able to participate. That might be when we're using more external cues. There might have to be more caregiver training on how to cue that individual with the strategies we're going to look at next appropriately. And of course, you're looking at ADL equipment, range of motion, all of the typical things we're already um, including for that patient. There are some targeted programs, just to mention, I am not supporting or encouraging any program in particular, but I did want to mention the ones that are out there and define them so that you have a little bit of a sense. The LSVT big and loud programs, these are multi-directional whole body specific programs um, that are looking at movement in those large amplitudes for patients in rhythmical patterns to help improve their functioning. Um, there is a newer one called Power Moves that's looking more at adding in um, anti-gravity or against gravity, weight shifting type of exercise, looking at more complex tasks for individuals. Um, the there are programs you can use that are set like this. And then as we already discussed, you're probably using a lot of strategies that these programs also incorporate on your own. The research doesn't necessarily support that one is better than the other, just different options. Motor planning is something we're going to work on with our patients, that um, the person usually has challenges with using their own internal feedback mechanisms to recognize and regulate their movements in order to have them be appropriate, in order to move fast enough to avoid someone in that crowd, in order to um, reach appropriately for that grab bar in the shower quick enough if they were losing their balance in order to turn before they sit down so they don't miss that chair those are more in the later stages of the disease process but in the earlier stage it would be um maybe just strategies we start teaching the person so that they can continue to use them we're looking at this kind of paradox that when someone presents with Parkinson's disease, the least attention demanding or most automatic task is the one that has the most problems. Usually we think the hardest thing we're doing is what would get difficult. It's the opposite with Parkinson's disease. And I think it's important to educate the patients and caregivers on this. It's the easy stuff. It's the ride in the bicycle that becomes compromised. So when you have that individual, because that basal ganglia, it's that organizational leader, it's that error correction, it's that sequencing and timing of things, it's not functioning. So when we have that individual where they um, are standing up and trying to swallow their pills, that swallow, that um, ability is going to be compromised. That as they're concentrating and thinking about swallowing, that ability to stand, that balance is what's going to be compromised. That's the thing they're not thinking about. And we need to then maybe tell them, you need to be sitting down when you're swallowing your, your pills. Um, that if we are progressing a patient in terms of challenge, making a, t a task we're doing with them more challenging, if we are doing, um, maybe we're, we have them on the uh, balance ball and we're doing activities for postural control, keeping their chin level so they're swallowing appropriately, we're having them reach or do something fun and engaging that they like. Um, if you add talking on top of that, it may make it too difficult that their balance may get lost because now they're trying to add talking on it and all those automatic easy things that should be happening while they're thinking about what they want to say to you, they fall by the wayside. Again, look at when patients are having challenges at home with specific functional activities. Is this paradox presenting itself? Do we need to uh, modify the way things are performed so that they, those automatic pieces, the balance, the sitting, the 
wallowing, things like that can still happen safely. Uh, and then same thing in our clinic. In order to train our patients, we're going to use different types of attentional strategies. We can accomplish this in a lot of different ways, and I'm sure you're already doing all these uh, different things. The research does continue to support them as beneficial. Maybe you're using different types of uh, floor markers, stickers that come down that don't peel up, um, or if the, these adhere to a specific types of carpeting, as long as they're going to stay level and not be a trip uh, fall risk. Um, that maybe right in front of the patient's chair where they need to stop and turn around, you have these sitting there or just a piece of tape and an X or where they're supposed to stop and stand uh, before they reach for that grab bag and grab bar in the shower. Uh, or if we want them to, you know, continue walking in a certain path, how to get to a specific room, they can, you know, follow the arrows that go along. We can use these in different ways. You could just use a laser pointer to show someone where we want them to be going. Think about the color contrast uh, as I showed those different um, aspects also. Um, look at cue cards for patients in terms of visual cues that maybe um, for when they first get up in the morning, there's something that says very simple that they help develop and you use this mantra when you're training them and then they have a visual maybe laminated cue card sitting there that says, feet flat, scoot forward, nose over toes, push, push, stand, or something like that. Um, that keeps it simple, makes it more cognitive, so they're paying attention because that automatic component may not uh, specifically be there for that individual. In terms of auditory cues, we're going to do with our verbal commands the same thing that we would if we're using those different cue cards for the patient. We're going to keep them short, simple, um, nothing complex, left, right, one, two. We're all doing those things already, and the research does continue to support that those are beneficial. Uh, metronomes have come a long way. This is a little portable one that you could have clipped on yourself, or if the patient needs it, um, the family member could have it clipped on, and the metronome gives them the beat to walk on. Research shows that for um, our the pacing that it should be at to help the individual keep pace with gait, for males, they say somewhere between 110 to 120 beats per minute. And then for females, they're saying somewhere between 105 to 115. I'm going to turn this on so that you hear what that um, sounds like, because it sounds very fast. So that's a typical walking pace. Um, and if you play with it, you'll, you'll see that it actually is a comfortable um, walking pace. You might need to modify it for your patient, but that might be something to utilize in your um, training. That auditory cue is going to kind of bypass that internal automatic pathway, and now it becomes a little um, kind of more, more cognitive for the patient. Playing music. Um, Again, music therapy has come so far. I used to, uh, way back when, waltzing, given the pop age of the population at the time I was working with, they all waltzed when they were younger. I said, ah, here's the thing. I'm the leader. That I, I lead, not you. Um, if it was my male patients. Um, so waltzing, having to count out that one, two, three, one, two, three. And then, you know, you lead them in the direction for balance that works. Newer research says that the tango, seems to be at a good pace and beat to help make movements um, more automatic to help that person. And we can use that for balance. If you're doing upper extremity range of motion exercises or sitting balance, you can tie in with it. Be playing music, have someone playing a guitar and they're tapping this, the you know cymbal or the tambourine and you're placing it in a way that is increasing their uh, range of mo motion for them. Um, they are finding that these different strategies are beneficial for patients to help with their movement patterns. Some other attentional strategies, those are all external cues that are coming. Some internal cueing that can be utilized. 
They're finding because of the connections to the limbic system, that motivation system where apathy may set in um, or patients may develop depression, that there really needs to be an expectation of success, that that positive emotional set is so important. Have them say, I can, I will, I'm going to do this, and then keep whatever you're asking them to do as simple as possible and encourage them to talk this out with themselves in their head and have them actually be able to achieve it. Because if they don't have this positive emotional set, any little change, anything less than perfection is going to be that kind of self-fulfilling prophecy for the individual. And they find that it really has significant negative impacts for them. We can use mental imagery where the individuals, you know, envisioning themselves, picturing themselves, doing different activities. One study looked at individuals watching a video of them ambulating with appropriate gait pattern versus watching someone else with a normal pattern. And they found the individuals seeing themselves ambulate appropriately allowed for better visualization and carryover. Same thing if you're doing auditory cues. Some studies said hearing their own voice give the cue, maybe even recording it, seemed to be more beneficial along with mental rehearsal where they're kind of, you know, seeing, planning that activity out and then pair that with actually doing it seems to be um, helpful. And then they are finding that yoga is beneficial because it kind of combines all these different inputs, the mindfulness, the range of motion, it's calming um, to the autonomic system. Um, and then it just is a lot of specificity in movement and a lot of external cueing also. And that internal dialogue they find seems to be helpful for patients. So those are some other strategies you can look at incorporating and something where you could get the caregiver involved um, with the patient so that it can carry over to outside the clinic to allow them to have better performance with their activities. We will resume back now talking about our intervention strategies for individuals who present with Parkinson's disease. And to be honest, a lot of these strategies you're probably using with many different patients, and they are similar to what we will be utilizing with patients with the other diagnoses that we are discussing today, um, because they are beneficial strategies for all of the different types of extrapyramidal dysfunction where there are those challenges in the automatic uh, movement patterns. Dual task performance. This is when there is a multiple tasking or performing more than one activity at the same time, it allows for several well-learned tasks to be performed safely, appropriately, and effectively. Um, the challenge is that if they're not well-learned, they'll be um, incorrect performance. And when we're relying on that automatic system in an individual with Parkinson's disease, that automatic piece 
is what will be most compromised. That there will be a deterioration, for example, in gait if we're asking someone to walk and do something else, either that's more cognitively or physically demanding for them, that because those automatic mechanisms are most vulnerable, that's why we call it a posture second strategy, uh, that that postural control is lost. It comes second. The brain starts focusing on whatever the other more difficult, complex task is that's using other centers of the brain. And then that basal ganglia is supposed to be doing this, and it's not. Um, that's why we will start to see patients with just maybe early on, if your patient is in early stage of Parkinson's disease, look closely at their gait. When they are dual tasking, are you seeing a decrease in velocity? Maybe it's just a change in symmetry of the stride or the step length, or it just becomes shorter, even if it remains symmetrical. Maybe their standing postural sway is going to increase. Um, there's a greater amplitude of it. It might be something subtle, but start looking for that so that you can teach the patient and train to that because the concern is not only can it impair function, but it can increase the risk of falling for that individual. Early on, we may just be noticing if there are challenges and teaching the patient strategies. Later in the disease process, we might find that we have to modify how the individual is performing their activities because it's just not safe for them to be performing a dual tasking type of activities. Some places to consider this. We, you know, we can go with the obvious that the example that I said, if they're standing up trying to swallow a pill, they might have difficulty swallowing because they're, they're focusing on, um, you know, the standing or vice versa. Think about that patient who is still working. They are at an early stage of their Parkinson's disease. They're still working. And as they are working they're, or they're shopping in the grocery store, they're walking while they're trying to read something. Well, that's dual tasking you know, their balance might be compromised. If they are someone who is going into meetings and they're still working on their computer and someone's talking to them and they're standing up, well, some they may not be able to coordinate all that. So be aware of this with that posture second strategy that you're looking at opportunities to train in dual tasking. And the studies show that whether you train cognitive and motor separately or you dual task them together, there can be benefits from both for the patient. Uh, there seems to be uh, the need for continuous training that about 40 minutes of dual task training three times a week over six weeks in several different studies seem to be sufficient to get carryover. Um, and then the individual is going to continue to work on that on their own. Um, and here's a couple more examples. It would depend on the needs of your specific patient. You might have them if they've mastered the sit to stand and it's safe, have them recite as many animals as they can that begin with the letter, you know, R. Uh, have them, if you're doing your gait training, in addition to your typical obstacle avoidance, maybe have them react to a specific, you know, cue, a verbal cue or a specific sound. Every time you hear this horn honk, I want you to turn left or I want you to stop. Um, the digit span we know is the counting. You could just be asking them questions as they're walking. Uh, what are different colors? Things like that different ways to train for that dual tasking. With our motor task, uh, adding that as an additional strain, because the concern with dual tasking in this case is looking at their ability to sustain that automatic uh, component. They might just be holding an object simply. As you're doing that balance training, you may not be jumping right to reaching, you know, for a ball or throwing something. Maybe can they just sit steady and balance while holding something? Can they shift their center of gravity while holding a ball on a tray or while buttoning their shirt? Um, consider in terms of that, you know, cognitive load that you're putting on the patient and we're training them for at home. 
while they're getting dressed in the morning, maybe the TV shouldn't be on with different noises, particularly if they're in later stages of the diseases where they might be having different um, hallucinations or challenges. We don't want anything that might trigger them. Um, so there's lots of ways we can incorporate different dual tasking for the individual to get carryover. I think of dual tasking almost the way I think of uh, when we do our balance training, we're going to do, um, you know, flat level surfaces and then challenge them more with different surfaces. We're doing eyes open, we're more eyes closed. I'm also incorporating cognitive dual tasking, higher and lower levels, motor dual tasking, higher motor levels, combined dual tasking, higher motor. So there's so many different ways. But what you need to realize is what is your specific patient having challenges with so you can marry that in your interventions. And that's where some of the assessments and just talking to them and the caregiver help. Freezing of gait is a challenge for many individuals who present with Parkinson's disease. This is that inability to progress with movement um, where they're, they're literally frozen. They, they just can't, can't go um, anymore. It happens because the body just can't adjust um, the speed or size of the steps that the individual is taking to meet the demands of the situation. Usually it's when a situation is changing uh, during transitions, uh, when the individual becomes anxious or overwhelmed, so possibly in crowds, and then often with dual tasking, uh, individuals might experience this. It just doesn't allow them to change their the quality or amount of their movement to meet the needs of the situation and they become stuck. There is a freezing of gait questionnaire that uh, can be utilized to scale this and then to get examples of when it might happen. Uh, some of the sample questions from that is, um, uh, do you feel that your feet get glued to the floor while walking, making a turn, or when trying to start movement? And then it's a scale of never to always. And then you can ask, you know, how long it lasts for the patient, because maybe that's your grading. Maybe your goal is to have them freeze for less time, and that'll show you that some of the strategies are working for them. Um, when we consider uh, freezing of gait, we're going to look at that minimizing of the distractions or freezing of mobility. So again, Again, uh, think about where you're working with them in the clinic, you're navigating your route, again, family members being um, considerate to that. Some modifications uh, that might be helpful if it's thresholds or doorways or transitions between rooms, maybe continue the flooring pattern into the next room and then put a mat there if in the same, if that's where the patient's supposed to stop before they go to the next movement, uh, that might help with them just kind of continue with the activity. Um, some other tools that are available. They're now making these uh, little laser pointers that can go on the front of the shoes that'll project a line to let the patient know that's where the next step is. This was uh, developed in accordance with the Michael J. Uh, Fox Foundation. They're also looking at developing canes and assistive devices that would sense the pressure on it to know when the person has frozen to give some type of vibration or visual cue or laser pointer, um, just to kind of break that cycle for the patient, break that, that cognitive thought of take a step, take a step, let's go, let's move, which is not what they should be thinking because it actually makes them, them freeze uh, even more. Um, they are finding that resistance training does seem to help patients. Uh, when, as we said, the resistance training with that unstable base of support, either on a ball or, um, you know, even if they're supine doing exercises, you can put them on something a little more compliant. Um, that, that does seem to be more beneficial and activate different areas of the brain that helps with postural adjustments, in anticipating movement that carries over to uh, decrease freezing of gait. When we look at more basic opportunities for our patient, um, we have the metronome, we have the music that can help with the rhythm. A lot of times this is happening in the person's daily life. So we need to teach them and the caregiver how to uh, adjust and accommodate for this. One mantra that you can suggest for the patient is don't fight the freeze. 
don't be in their own head just okay let's move let's go or the family member saying okay let's go lift your feet let's go that is not helping uh the abcs are more to break down the task give enough time and just stop and pause a little modification of some different uh, mantras out there are stop straighten shift step so when the person freezes stop you don't have to move now it's okay stop do something different stand up straighter do a little weight shifting now try and step you're breaking that cycle you're taking it out of that that kind of loop that they're stuck in because that automatic let's go is not there that's what's not functioning some other things that could be done are just to make it conscious effort to um to walk so when someone is going to walk around a hallway so let's say you know they're they're coming this way and they're walking around that hallway and that's a change in environment right that might be difficult for that individual to to keep going because it's not automatic make it cognitive just put lines there of tape on the floor well now they see the lines doesn't have to even equal their spaces like lines i should follow those lines that may help them go it's a different type of visual cue break the cycle for them just break it down. If they're ambulating with their spouse, maybe their spouse gives them a little peck on the cheek. Well, now they're in a different mental place. They're in a different, now it changed. They're not frozen now. And then maybe they can go. Maybe they stop and they, you know, lift your arm up. Give me a high five. And that broke the cycle. You just need to find for that patient what gets them out of that um, kind of pause button of the automatic movement and shift it to other other centers of the brain to try try and get them going again or at least that that's how i think of it or or try to try to explain it for some patients all these strategies may not be sufficient or successful enough and they do require uh, the implantation of deep brain stimulation this has changed immensely over time initially it was started just to address those isolated kind of resting tremors and now um, in more recent years they're using it more for early stages of the disease and they're looking at even self-tuning devices that will adjust more for the patients um, typically they're utilized for individuals who do not yet have signs of dementia so they're not that progressed in their disease process um, they have had their Parkinson's disease for at least four years. Levodopa um, is working, but it's just not enough. They're having more of that off time challenge for this individual, um, just because they need something additional to help manage their symptoms. And that is the key. That the goal is to not change the neurodegeneration. That disease process, unfortunately, is happening. The intent here is to reduce the motor symptoms. We're trying to help that person move better. Just reduce those side effects from the lack of dopamine and have them move better. And different studies are showing that individuals need less medication then because they're able to move better. So it's really motor symptoms. You're not changing the course of the disease. You're not changing cognitive decline. You're just making it a little easier and better, the physician is, for that person to move.
The mechanism of action, they're not solid on one explanation for the, the mechanism of action. They're also, um, the research is sev presenting several different regions of the brain that can be targeted with the deep brain stimulator. In animal studies, what they think is most commonly accepted that there is some uh, suppression of the neurons um, action potential that are firing that create abnormal movement? Or is it just interrupting the abnormal movement firing, uh, abnormal uh, neurons that are firing to stop them, to allow more typical movement to occur? Is it just activating more centers in the higher cortex that allow for better cognitive function and control of movement? Honestly, they're really not sure, uh, so they're, they're still working on figuring that out. Where they have made some advances is to get the medication delivered to the patient in a more consistent way, so there's less fluctuation with those on and off times. There is um, an intrajejunal pump that is utilized to inject the kind of like a continuous flow, the individual has um, a stoma that's in, inserted here on the left. So we need to do stoma care, make sure that's not getting infected. Um, and then they have on their wrist a little unit. So that's continually pumping the medication in there through that percutaneous pump uh, so that it can deliver a more constant level. They are finding in this one particular study in Romania, they followed individuals for 10 years up until recently, 2019. They did find that um, there was a 29% decrease in wearing off for patients. They had more consistency in their uh, levels, even a year after using the pump. Their Parkinson's disease rating scale improved, so their function was better. So this is looking at a uh, potential positive. The idea is that levodopa, ha when it gets into the plasma, it has a kind of a short half-life in there. So they need to keep the levels continuously fed so that it can remain more stable for the to be present for neuron function in the brain. Future, they're looking at many different things. One of the current ones that's out there are different virtual reality games. It's a head unit that the individual would wear. And again, making things cognitive in a sense where um, they are moving without having to think about moving um, through different cueing that's getting them to move internal and external. These virtual reality games um, are put them in a really rich environment. Maybe they're outside in a field. And if they're a word person, it's almost like a, uh, a Wheel of Fortune makes me think of. They're not spinning, but you know they have to fill in the letters. There's a puzzle, and they have to you know pick up the letter from by the tree and put it in there to spell the word. Or if they like sports, it's the names of different sports teams that they have to put in a certain order. So it's motivating. It's hitting in all these different aspects that we discussed, and then it would be coordinated to improve the functional mobility for that particular uh, patient. They're working on different biosensors that can read those uh, levels for the patient to allow for more appropriate uh, medication adjustment over time, very thin, small measures. And they're also looking at being able to utilize those sensors when they're testing new medications to see their effectiveness. Another presentation of Parkinson's disease are those individuals who present with early onset. Early onset uh, Parkinson's disease occurs, sometimes it's called young onset also. The estimation is it's somewhere between 5 and 20% of individuals um, with Parkinson's disease have it evidenced before the age of 50. And of those individuals, about half of them are evidencing the symptoms before the age of 40. While the disease process is the same, with the Lewy body formation, the alpha synuclein, what's physiologically happening is the same. However, what they see when it, the onset of the disease process is earlier, it tends to progress just a little more slowly. So the neurodegeneration happens at a slower rate. However, because it lasts longer, the person ends up with more significant damage to those uh, dopaminergic centers. 
because it's happening at more of a slower rate, they're starting to see a little bit different clinical presentation for individuals. Uh, while they will present with those hallmark motor symptoms, uh, they tend to have milder cognitive decline. So we're not going to see as much of impairment in the later stages even of that cognitive sy system. What you do notice earlier on is more dyskinesia. And Michael J. Fox is probably one of the um, most well-known individuals with early onset Parkinson's disease. Mild dyskinesia that patients might present with early on that could be like a red flag that it is Parkinson's disease is uh, cramping, stiffness in the limb, tends to be the more common early symptoms along with the, the other hallmarks then would start to present themselves. What they also find is more behavioral influence. If you're treating someone with early onset Parkinson's disease, our patients talk to us, right? With any of our patients, we they, they share with us. We learn what's going on in their lives because we're conversational with them. What you want to kind of be aware of with the patients with the diagnosis of early onset so you can make outside referrals as needed is that these individuals tend to have more challenges with impulse control. That that kind of reward and satisfaction system that we've discussed that is dampened in individuals with Parkinson's disease is significantly compromised in individuals with early onset and much earlier on that pleasurable, beha pleasurable behaviors need to be performed excessively and continuously to satisfy that individual. You tend to see more gambling, spending, hypersexuality, overeating. And then that, remember, Parkinson's disease already has its own challenges with social interaction, um, individual mood, emotion, behavior. Now you're putting on top of that the risk of depression, the decreased quality of life, potential financial and legal consequences depending on what they get involved in. Um, and somehow it's related to the medications that are utilized. They're not really sure. One particular study um, looked around the globe at different countries to find trends. And what they found is countries where there tends to be more use of the internet, we tend to see an increase in the prevalence of the impulse control behaviors. And to give you an idea, just in general, globally, as internet use becomes, you know, our, our daily uh, way of functioning. Remember, this is early onset individuals in, in midlife. Um, then in 2006, it was about 6.6% of individuals presented with significant impulse control behaviors. 2010, 14%. By 2013, it was almost 19%. So it's escalating and they're accounting that to the easy access of these things. In the United States, it tends to be um, a more overspending, as well as in Italy, in France, they found that individuals tended towards more binge eating. Um, just something um, to bring up to, again, look at our patients to see what else might be going on, um, to see if referrals might, might be necessary. Levodopa-induced dyskinesia. This is a condition that develops. So it's not on off it's not off time so it is not the same thing off time is that the individuals taking their medications the medications are working but before the next dose kicks in while the previous dose is wearing off in the morning their typical parkinson's symptoms emerge that's on off time this is different the medication is at peak plasma levels the medication is working. Those hallmark symptoms are being controlled. The bradykinesia, the uh, tremors, the rigidity, all that is under control. However, after long-term use of the medications, the individual starts to develop hyperkinetic movement. So now they have excess movement. They have, you know, excess kind of moving or that titubation of the head. And if you've seen Michael J. Fox in interviews, you, you, you tend to see some of this. You can hear it in, in the individual's uh, speech, maybe during gait, they kind of just like kick that leg out. And these are individuals where they have on-time dyskinesia, medications working. Now they have these abnormal movement patterns that are kind of excess and unnecessary 
evidencing themselves. Um, and this might need to be a medication adjustment. It might just be something the individual has to um, deal with. So just be, be aware of keeping uh, your eye out for this to see if, again, the maybe medications need to be adjusted or it's something if we have fall risk or concerns uh, that we need to teach the patient own self-awareness with and compensatory strategies for. What we've discussed up to this point are late onset and early onset Parkinson's disease, very specific disease process, clinical presentation, motor, non-motor, later on cognitive. That's where we were. Now we're moving into atypical Parkinsonism. So ism means it, it kind of looks like. These are conditions where it looks like Parkinson's disease based on the clinical presentation, but it's not the same disease process. There is another reason that the physical presentation seems to be Parkinson's disease. The abnormal movement patterns fits with Parkinson's disease, but it's not. It's not happening for the same reason. It may be because of a specific identifiable cause that can be addressed, or it might be a whole other disease process with its own set of symptoms, and just a couple of those symptoms look like Parkinson's disease, and that's called Parkinson's Plus. So it looks like Parkinson's, plus they have this other condition. It's not really Parkinson's disease. We'll look at this more closely because it's very important that the patient has the correct diagnosis, that we understand what they're being treated for because there are different impairments and the medical management is different and how we approach the patient with our strategies needs to be different also. When we look at the general category of atypical Parkinson's disease, presents like Parkinson's disease, but there's a reason they're presenting with these abnormal movement patterns. It might be drug-induced that certain medications are leading to the development of the bradykinesia, the resting tremor, not the same as tardive dyskinesia. Those are patients that are on long-term medications, these same ones, but now they have a different deterioration in the brain as a side effect, and they have hyperkinetic excess movement. Atypical Parkinsonism from medications is where the individual develops that kind of slowing of things, that rigidity, bradykinesia, um, smallness of their movement um, because of a side effect of a medication they're on. On the plus side, if they are taken off the medication, that symptom should go away. Another cause is trauma, CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Um, if we think of Muhammad Ali, he is probably the most well-known individual. He did not have Parkinson's disease. He had Parkinsonism due to his CTE. So his clinical presentation looked like um, Parkinson's disease, but it is not. It's the excessive diffuse external injuries that happens in individuals who um, are boxers, who have excessive subconcussive or concussive injuries from different types of uh, contact sports. Uh, rugby might be another example, wrestling, where their brain damage makes it look like Parkinson's disease because the different regions of the brain that are impacted. Certain metabolic disease like Wilson's disease, that alteration, it's very rare, but that change in uh, copper metabolism uh, that normally supports uh, neuron growth in the brain is altered, so it will look like Parkinson's disease. And then certain toxins can lead to uh, manganese is one, uh, that it alters the protein um, in the brain that creates these symptoms. Um, there is a synthetic form of uh, heroin that leads to atypical Parkinsonism. Um, so again, recognizing why the individual presents with it is going to lead to a different treatment for them. The clinical presentation, as we said, is going to be that typical bradykinesia. Most of the patients do not actually present with a, a tremor. 
Another difference is it's more likely to be symmetrical in nature that individuals with true Parkinson's disease, it's asymmetrical because it just depends on where the neuronal damage is. And then Parkinson's medications are not going to work because it's not a lack of levodopa or uh, sorry, a lack of dopamine that levodopa is going to help with that causes the, cha the problem for that particular patient. Um, so it, again, it's important for it to be diagnosed appropriately so it can be treated. The Parkinson's plus syndromes where the individual presents with some hallmark symptoms that look like Parkinson's disease, but it's actually due to an entirely different neurologic condition are Parkinson's plus, sorry, Parkinson's plus syndromes. Um, they have another primary condition. What I've highlighted here are some of the key differences to distinguish them because in your assessments, you will notice different things. There is a difference between someone who has Parkinson's disease that has progressed, it has progressed outside to the neocortex and now they've developed dementia late, late, late in the disease process. And we know Lewy bodies are a component of Parkinson's from our pathogenesis. That is different than someone who has dementia with Lewy bodies. So where the Lewy bodies cause regions of the brain that impact cognitive function to be affected first, they present with dementia first, then later on in the disease process, because they're so significantly impaired, they have decreased motor function and it looks like Parkinson's disease. Very different. They're actually like opposite clinical presentations. Um, MSA, multiple uh, system atrophy. These individuals tend to have more autonomic changes, fluctuation in um, blood pressure, urinary uh, uh, bladder control. Uh, ADL changes, patients with progressive supranuclear palsy. These individuals will have a very specific impairment in ocular motion, and it might be worth it just to look. When you ask the patient to follow my finger and look up, they can't look up. Their eyes won't go up. Um, that is just a hallmark of that condition and way to distinguish it. They also have very prominent facial folds that kind of look, look like they're mad. Um, and then patients with uh, cortical basal ganglionic degeneration. These individuals, the culprit here is more tau protein, but just briefly to get into it, you're going to see more um, apraxia. They're going to have um, more unilateral presentation where one side of the body, one arm, one leg is more affected than the other side. They're going to have more jerky type of movements. And again, some of those key differences might be something to add to your assessments just or to observe for if you're working with patients where maybe they are trying to figure out a diagnosis or if you're thinking, wow, it just really doesn't fit as true Parkinson's disease. Huntington's disease is the next condition that we will examine. This is a genetic condition. It's autosomal dominant that leads to neurodegeneration. Um, it does seem to affect males and females equally. The way that we know so much about this condition is because of one 
particular family in Zuli of Venezuela. They live on an island, and because it is a genetic condition, it doesn't really present itself until midlife, so it's after childbearing years, so it does get passed on. This particular family were ostracized from the rest of the, the community, unfortunately. So this island, um, the research says they had 10 generations, 18,000 family members over all the decades donated blood samples, skin samples, the brains upon their passing so we can really, the researchers could really understand Huntington's disease. And what they find in this condition, there is a juvenile form, it's not as common, is it's, uh, again, twofold, that the individual has difficulty initiating voluntary movement, and they're also going to have excessive involuntary movement. So this is a hyperkinetic disorder. They're going to have excess of that involuntary movement, but they're also going to have difficulty initiating their movement. Combining that with behavior, um, cognitive, and psychiatric symptoms. So there are multiple centers that are impacted for these individuals. Unfortunately, after diagnosis, usually midlife, unless they have the juvenile form, 10 to 20 years is the life expectancy. What happens in Huntington's disease, because of the um, abnormal genetic code on the HTT gene, uh, travel with me for a moment back to your uh, neurology class, or a and P. <laughs> Two, I think it would be. Um, when you look at the sequencing on D DNA, the cytonine adding guadenine sequence, on this particular gene that gives the codes. Normally that gene should be repeated, that code, the CAG should go about, you know, 10 to 15 times to give the right instructions. What they find in individuals with Huntington's disease is that it repeats 36 to 120 times. So it gives the wrong instructions. It has this really long genetic coding. So it's giving misinstructions to that Huntington protein. So when that protein is made, the, the protein is abnormal. It's not the right um, structure to it. And that um, abnormal protein that's excessively long, it really can't function normally in the neurons of the brain. And it starts to inhibit the chemical signaling. And because it's so long, the, you know, the body tries to kind of chop it up and then it becomes toxic. It clumps together. And then what they're also finding is an, an extension of that. It damages the neurons so much that they can't even repair themselves. Uh, so the neurons just start to die in the cerebral cord cortex. And these individuals are um, presenting with challenges in thinking, emotions, movement, just so many different aspects. 
I read out, wrote out clearly the clinical presentation for these um, individuals with um, Huntington's disease. I'll just hit on some of the um, hallmarks. It is a neurotoxic, so it that those fragments are actually killing the neurons in the brain, and it's neurodegenerative because the other ones are breaking down too. Because of this, it's going to be progressive for the individual, uh, dominated by creiform movements that are kind of more jerky, twisting type of dance-like movements. And because they have that kind of involuntarily, when they try to initiate normal movement, or I should say typical movement, they're unable to do that. Combine that with when they do try to activate that normal movement, they have that hypokinetic aspect to the disease where they're more rigid, they can't break through that resting tone, um, they have bradykinesia, that slowness of being able to start and stop and activate the movements in the adult form, it affects speech also. In terms of cognitive impairment, you need to be aware of this when you're interacting with the patient, that they are not going to process as quickly. Um, we need to take our time and we need to recognize that they're going to present with anosognosia. This means that the individual, they don't realize that they're impaired that because of the region of the brain that is damaged, um, about 50% of the individuals, they don't realize that anything's wrong. So if you're trying to get them to participate in therapy, they may not think they need it and they're not trying to be difficult. It's just the impairment in the brain. So you may need to find another way to encourage participation. And that's going to be combined with short-term memory impairment. There tends to be more of uh, leaning towards aggression, anger, uh, irritability, and put that with the fact that they don't think anything is wrong. You could see how we really need to be considerate of our approach to these patients. The emotional processing piece for individuals with uh, Huntington's disease, it relates to theory of mind, and this occurs with individuals with many different conditions. Theory of mind um, looks at, you know, if you uh, use the picture cards of different emotions, can the person read that? Can you kind of extrapolate what someone is feeling or thinking based on their facial expression. Particularly with negative emotions, um, you know, anger. If I'm looking at you like this, you can tell I'm angry. A person with Huntington's disease is not realizing that. If someone's like this, you can tell I'm sad. They're not going to catch that. So because they're not catching the emotions behind the other individual, their reactions to social interactions are not appropriate. They can't recognize the social cues, so their behavior then becomes inappropriate. And if you consider these are individuals, you know, middle-aged that are probably still trying to work and function, this could cause a lot of challenges uh, socially, emotionally, in the workplace, um, relationships among caregivers. So be aware of that as you're um, working with them, particularly with negative emotion. The recognition of that is low and that could cause a lot of uh, frustration in particular for caregivers.
The most common assessment tool um, for individuals with Huntington's disease is the Unified Rating Scale. It has several different uh, sections to it, and it is going to uh, help to, if, particularly if you um, want a resource to look at more of those cognitive and behavioral components that to guide your interactions and see if additional uh, maybe co-treatments or advice from their other caregivers, um, psychi psychiatrists, psychologists, you know, other disciplines might be necessary. Uh, sections two and three will focus more on those particular aspects for um, the individual. This is an MRI scan of an individual with Huntington's disease. And what we really see is just significant atrophy in so many different lobes of the brain. There's such a decrease in that gray matter that hits on all these different areas. The clinical course and interventions are going to vary for the individual based on the stage of the disease that they are uh, presenting with. Early on with the disease process, we're going to focus, focus on mobility. We might still be working on a stationary bike, working on strengthening for the individual, you know, getting them to be able to coordinate their work tasks, energy conservation, sweet sequencing, dual tasking, all of those types of things. Um, in more the middle stage of the disease, this is where the individual is becoming more impaired. Maybe they are ambulating with an assistive device or they're moving more towards a wheelchair level of a function where they need um, assistance and appropriate prescription. Don't forget respiratory training for these individuals. Um, that includes posture as well as actual um, assisted coughing, breathing exercises that tends to become uh, very compromised in these um, individuals. Splinting might be necessary for different areas of the body to allow for more um, appropriate functioning. And then unfortunately, in late stages of the diseases, we're looking to be more supportive in nature with our um, interventions. And oh, I wanted to note also that for um, when we're working with individuals with Huntington's disease, there are a couple of research studies out there that looked at aerobic training and resistance training with that population. And it's important to realize and even to communicate to our patients that they can still exercise. It's at their level. They could still lift a weight. Maybe it's a little one and maybe we need to modify it to make sure that it's safe. safe. Um, they are finding that significant improvements in endurance um, with VO2 max improved, six minute walk test improved. Um, with resistance and aerobic training, their Parkinson's disease rating scale numbers were also improved, body composition uh, and mental health. So there seems to be a lot of benefits benefits to um, different types of exercises for individuals with um, Huntington's disease. And on imaging studies, they're even finding that comparing individuals with Huntington's disease to those without when they participated in even 20 minutes of moderate intensity exercise, that the individuals with Huntington's disease like even 40 minutes after they were done exercising, there was better perfusion to the brain. And if we think about that disease process, better perfusion should correlate to better functioning. So there are benefits here. Um, in addition to these other strategies that we've used and discussed today uh, to that aerobic and exercise training for this population. Frederick's ataxia is the final condition that we are going to discuss today. This now, we talked about Parkinson's disease and Parkinsonism, which are extrapyramidal basal ganglia type of pathology um, where the pathogenesis is with motor and non-motor clinical presentation and some cognitive impairment. Then we looked at Huntington's disease, which is more involving more of a diffuse brain atrophy. It's a genetic condition that individuals present with where we're seeing not only motor involvement, but also more of a cognitive impairment. Now we're moving to a different region of the brain looking at the cerebellum. And individuals with Frederick's ataxia, ataxia being in the name, we're looking at cerebellar involvement. This again is a genetic condition. It's autosomal recessive. 
It is also progressive, just like the other conditions that we have discussed. Um, it was actually discovered back in the 1860s. It's named for Dr. Frederick, who uh, was a German doctor who discovered it. Um, it is the most form of hereditary ataxia in the United States. Um, I've treated one patient with it. Uh, this condition long time ago. Um, so you may or may not encounter it, but it's important to know these conditions when, when we do. This uh, condition tends to evidence itself in early childhood. While with Huntington's disease, the juvenile form is more rare, that presents initially more midlife, Frederick's ataxia tends to present earlier when individuals are between 5 and 15 years old. And that's another reason that I wanted to include it, because if you're treating patients, pediatric population, um, or if for orthopedic reasons or and, or neuro reasons where they're working on a diagnosis. Um, it's just important to know about this about this condition for differential diagnosis. Um, it typically starts as just an unsteadiness of gait for the child, maybe a clumsiness, there's scoliosis that becomes evident, and then it continues to become a progressive condition that does shorten the individual's life expectancy. The estimation is that some about 10 to 20 years after the initial diagnosis, so the person is in, you know, maybe their in the 20s or 30s at that point, they're looking more at being wheelchair dependent. It does have a variable progression. Some individuals, if it's less severe, they may live well into their 60s. Uh, the gentleman that I included in the image here, uh, he was diagnosed at 17 years old. He has participated in numerous uh, long distance bike rides. He, he posts his information to be motivational also. He does these races across America in his adapted uh, cycle. So just because someone has a neurodegenerative disease doesn't mean um, they can't have aspirations and participate at higher level of fitness activities. Well, for most patients, it is limiting. It Again, I put them in there just as a reminder uh, that's always good, that, that the door isn't closed to things. What happens in this specific uh, condition, the pathogenesis, it's another genetic mutation specifically on the FXN gene. And we see like in Huntington's disease that in, in this case, I, I think it's the GAA segment, it's repeating more than it should. So it doesn't give the appropriate uh, instructions for the synth synthesis of furaxetin. And furaxetin is found in the mitochondria, which are the powerhouse of the neurons. And because that mitochondria are then not functioning appropriately, the neuron doesn't function appropriately. It also seems to be that there's some alteration in the iron levels because of the different fragments of fraxatin that are created and the, that excess iron creates more free radicals that leads to oxidative stress and damage. Where this is targeting are going to be the peripheral nerve fibers and the spinal cord. So that gets us thinking motor deficits and motor weakness. Then there's also cerebellar degeneration. So now we're thinking coordination challenges, maybe tone changes, um, precision, accuracy of movement. On top of that, they're also finding that in almost a third of individuals, uh, cardiac fibers are impacted, and in a smaller percentage, about 10%, pancreatic cell dysfunction. So that fraxin tends to be in many different uh, areas of the body, so you're going to see a lot of different symptoms in these individuals. And when we also see that cardiac and pancreatic involvement, well, now we're thinking in addition to all of our mobility and positioning and wound management and breathing and everything we're thinking of, we also need to be considering cardiac health and well-being, uh, insulin sensitivity, and those other components, endurance. Um, so the individual is going to present with that typical ataxia from the cerebellar uh, damage, to head titubation tends to be common for individuals. They're also going to see in coordination of the cerebellum evidence as dysarthria. They're going to have difficulty forming the words of speech and dysphagia, difficulty with the swallowing, 
scanning speech is going to be where they are going to be talking like this because they can't coordinate the movement. So they're going to have kind of, it's not a breathiness, it's that they can't coordinate the speech and the breathing. So it kind of makes like a halted speech that's called uh, scanning speech for these individuals. Uh, there tends to be optic involvement. So hearing and as well as vision deficits, you might want to consider incorporating at least a simple vision assessment for these individuals. They, they feel it has to do with the mitochondrial changes and so fibrosis that's occurring in the optic nerve, um, and that may change their visual spatial relationships. Uh, proprioception is also compromised in these individuals um, and sensory impairment because we have that peripheral nerve and spinal cord involvement that is occurring for them. Um, what you do not see here is involvement in any regions of the brain that impacts um, affect thinking, memory, cognition. This is more, you know, mo motor, cardiac, um, more other system involvement for those individuals. The assessment tool that's utilized uh, specific for this population is the Frederick's Ataxia Rating Scale. It is uh, looking at a score of 0 to 159. Uh, a low score means that they're unaffected. The higher the score means more impaired that the individuals are, has good internal consistency, and they do find that it correlates well um, to the Barthel Index, the functional independence measure, and then also when they do neuroimaging studies. So this would be the tool to utilize with this population that's going to allow you to um, look at not only neurologic examination, ADLs, and give you a stage of their ataxia or their incoordination, it also looks at instrumental testing. Again, we're looking at individuals um, who are younger in life, they may still be working, and, and every individual is trying to function at their highest level. So it uses like a whole peg test, a timed walking test, some other measures that'll give you more information to help guide your intervention planning. Rehab considerations when we're working with this particular um, population. As I said, they're individuals who tend to be younger, so they're out and they're working. They're in formative years of their life. So you're looking at your ADLs, you're looking at your IADLs also. You're looking at compensatory strategies for the patient. Uh, don't forget to also assess vestibular involvement for them to see if that uh, needs to be addressed. Because of the tendency towards congestive heart failure, we're going to be aware of low-intensity exercise because of the loss of the proprioception and motor involvement combined with the cerebellar involvement for the ataxia, research is showing that Frankel's exercises may be beneficial for these individuals. Um, 
in order to help them compensate to like focus and have more body awareness to establish better control of their uh, movement patterns. And then adaptive equipment, wheelchair, uh, we'll be considering all of that, you know, teaching skin inspection, et cetera, for those uh, individuals. So we're going to be comprehensive in looking at um, cardiac health, wellness, as well as functional mobility, and keeping in mind in our communication strategies with these patients that they do not have impairment of cognition, memory, et cetera. So they may be more participant and be able to more throughout the entire disease process, give feedback, thoughts, ideas on what's working, what isn't. Uh, and not that we're, we avoid that with our other patients, but just because we have focused on the social, emotional, um, and cognitive impairment with the other diagnoses, I wanted to remind us that that we're not seeing those challenges for individuals with Frederick's ataxia. In conclusion, what we discussed today is looking at our different extrapyramidal system uh, conditions, understanding the pathology of the disease and how that leads to the critical presentation that we're seeing. And then we took some time examining how we can enhance the interventions that we're performing to have them be most beneficial to help improve the lives of our patients with movement disorders and be mindful to the uh, caregiver burden and support support systems needed social and emotionally for both the patient as well as their caregiver. How valid is the theory that Parkinson's disease is the result of a virus? While they know there's some trigger or mechanism of entry that we discussed into the body through that olfactory or gastrointestinal system, the relationship between specific viruses and Parkinson's disease, it's still debated in the medical and research community. What's really been identified is that they need more research to look at the possible long-term neurological sequela that lead to Parkinson's disease following specific viral types of infections. Um, I did read one study where they looked at um, research since 1986, and this was published in 2022. So they went back and looked at all different types of viral infections to try and identify if there was a root cause that they could truly connect. Ultimately, the study, you know, they were trying to look at is there some pathogen induced type of autoimmunity that triggers a reaction in the body that leads to the Parkinson's disease? Is it that autoimmune response or is it possibly uh, some type of low level inflammation that persists? It, from the research that I took a look at, um, there's not a distinct causal relationship that has been identified. Can motor assessment technology be used as motor feedback to correct posture and midline orientation? The specific technology that I discussed during the course for motor assessment is designed to gather information during the patient's regular daily routine um, to enhance the development of interventions to improve their function and quality of life outside of the clinic those sensor-based systems that I mentioned during the presentation are looking at a way to analyze the individual's mobility outside of the clinic to have a better sense of their different environmental factors, um, provides feedback in terms of how the individual is responding to different stimuli, whether it's auditory, visual, crowds, surfaces, whatever might be going on in their life, um, looking at fatigue, medication effectiveness to see if there are changes during those on-off times. So you would correlate those motor assessment results with other results, medication effectiveness, and yes, feedback on gait and postural control. It's more that they provide insight into um, carryover of function from the strategies that you're currently utilizing in the treatment plan. In terms of 
more of like a biofeedback type of technology using something like the Wii system uh, can engage the patient's reward system. It can provide a lot of rich sensory cues that could be utilized in the way that you're thinking. Um, you would select a game that encourages the postural shifts and midline orientation that the patient is struggling with to use it as kind of like a type of um, biofeedback because it would give them a cue if they're pay, paying, playing a game. Uh, and then again, it if it taps into that reward system or something that gives them enjoyment, whether or not the individual can express that, we might have better participation for them in uh, therapy. In terms of more advanced technology, um, biofeedback we know is that technique that aims to make um, unconscious or involuntary bodily processes perceptible in another way to the individual. Oftentimes it's auditory or lights moving as they recruit different muscles. And there's this interesting piece of technology out of Japan. It's a robot uh, type of suit with um, hybrid assisted limb technology. So it's called HAL. Um, it's a robotic exoskeleton that the individual puts on and is designed to facilitate movements of the robot triggered by the bioelectric signals that the individual generated from their brain and then the surface, surface electrodes the individual's wearing to think, oh, I want to lift my leg. The surface electrodes pick that up and then translate that into programming that would then have that exoskeleton assist that patient in moving the leg. So it's kind of like the exoskeleton is helping um, like an active assistance at, to the person's um, thought of movement. So the, re the research that I read, the idea is that the um, HAL is detecting those bioelectric signals from the wearer. And the hope is that as the individual says, well, I want to walk, the exoskeleton helps them do that. They're going to feel normal movement. They're going to receive um, appropriate input on how to move, increase proprioceptive awareness, um, re reach that reward participation achievement feeling. So the thought is that as this technology advances, that might be something beneficial to help individuals um, with Parkinson's disease. They completed a really small cohort study of eight patients um, doing core assisted squats. Um, I think they did one session a day for five sessions in order to um, see how the individual performed. And they found that there was a little bit of carryover into the individual's uh, functional activity. So I guess we'll see in the future what other technology is developed or if the uses of this um, type of biofeedback that you're thinking of expands for individuals with Parkinson's disease. Can you explain more about the VA prune recipe? Uh, so that's the Veterans Administration uh, prune whip recipe. I have the link here to that uh, website. We know that constipation is one of the non-motor symptoms that can occur in individuals with Parkinson's disease. And it's a result of that autonomic nervous system kind of slowing down, not regulating the smooth muscle activity as efficiently as it should, and that intestinal tract just not moving as effectively can contribute to that constipation. There's some research that says that those bowel muscles also might be a little bit weaker for the individual, um, that they may be clenching a little bit more than relaxing as the individual tries to pass their stool. Um, also, if someone with Parkinson's disease doesn't chew or swallow their food sufficiently because of their impairments, then or drink enough fluids, that's then going to impair their um, bowel movements. Combine that with more of a sedentary lifestyle due to mobility challenges, unfortunately, we're seeing constipation. So the um, VA came up with, I guess, a really good prune whip 
recipe. Um, it includes wheat bran, applesauce, of course, prune juice and fresh prunes uh, that the individual can consume. And it, it makes it, I guess, more enjoyable, feels like a little bit of a dessert, and then is a natural way to help with that process. As we think about that constipation, we know that that can cause pain and discomfort for the individual also, which they may not be able to express or even sufficiently process on their own. Um, not only just the pain, it could lead to urinary incontinence because of all the pressure, or urinary tract infections, uh, lethargy, nausea. So in addition to thinking about the food intake, also consider your patient's ability to chew and swallow and, and drink fluids and how sedentary they are as all ways to help manage that constipation to give them um, more comfort in their day-to-day -day life. What causes freezing of gait? Freezing of gait occurs in individuals with Parkinson's disease. And it's when the individual is moving or ambulating and they're unable to progress forward despite their intention to walk. It usually presents as a trembling in space. They're, they're just in place. They're not able to, to move or progress. The reason it occurs is because the brain can't adjust the speed or size of the steps fast enough to match the environment. That's why we often see this happening when the individual is in crowds or trying to make a tight turn that that inability we know with someone with Parkinson's disease to initiate movement is also their challenge with changing movements quickly, particularly during those transitions. So this is when the individual might freeze um, when they're trying to go through transitions or have more crowds. The, ultimately, the movements all mix together because of the motor planning challenges, and that leads to the freezing symptoms. Oftentimes, it may be exhibited as a unilateral impairment, um, causing difficulties um, with turning, either to sit down or around a corner, um, transitioning maybe through doorways where there, there's a change of surfaces in crowds, in environments where the individual may feel a little more stressed or quick changes or a lot of things um, going on. In order to gain some insights when this happens for the individual so you can assess it and help them utilize the strategies that we discussed is to utilize the new freezing of gait questionnaire that is self-reported. It's a nine item questionnaire and it is going to ask the individual questions. Do you, did you experience freezing in the last month? Yes or no. Um, and then it asks them to consider during their worst episodes how much are they able to walk? Do they actually need assistance or are they completely unable to walk or they're almost walking normal? It'll ask them, um, are your gait difficulties affecting your independence, your activities of daily living? Do your feet feel uh, glued to the floor while you're walking or making a turn? How long do the episodes last? So it'll give you more insight into that individual's ability to start and stop the movements. Also um, consider that there was one study that took a step back and said, well, we understand all of this related to the challenges with initiating or transitioning and changing movements that, that start and stop. Um, but what else goes into that? Could there be other variables that are going to influence the individual's ability? And they took a look at ankle range of motion to see if it made a difference for the individuals. And they looked at them turning to both sides, tight turns. They did range of motion measurements in the inside ankle and the outside ankle. And they found that the outer turning ankle um, range of motion was associated more 
with episodes of freezing. So let's say the individual is walking and they have to make a turn around a left-hand corner that's really tight. Well, this study found that the range of motion of that that outside right ankle is actually the one that was more associated with episodes of freezing if they didn't have good range of motion. That might be something we can look at if there is a symmetry in what we're able to achieve for range of motion, consider for the patient assessing turning in both directions, that more limited ankle being the one kind of inside that they're making the tighter turn around versus outside to see if maybe you can utilize the information from a study like this to avoid some of those episodes of freezing for the individual. And then also look more, a study like that gets us to think, well, maybe I do want to take a closer look at that ankle to see if improving range of motion might have a positive impact on episodes of freezing.